Isn't this a wonderful way of celebrating the International Day of Persons with Disabilities? And we said that this afternoon we're going to discuss together with the public and the private sector about building resilient societies and building the future we want together. Building the future societies. And we want the future societies to be inclusive of all. We said that persons with disabilities are agents of change, and this is the change we're bringing today. It's a change where we talk about all people, be that they are indigenous peoples with disabilities or not, be that they are women or men, girls and boys, whatever countries and corners of the world we're coming from. We are really trying to make a change so that everybody can benefit of it. And since the focus is about urban areas, we also want to make sure that our brothers and sisters from the indigenous community are welcome in urban areas. So this afternoon is going to be the afternoon where we talk about what we can do together, partnering together the public and the private sector to make urban areas accessible, inclusive, usable by all people with focus on resilience. This is what I wanted to share with you as opening remarks. Um, and I'm very honored to be the director of the Division for Social Policy and Development at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, a division that um, has been tasked by the department to house uh, and be the focal point for the whole United Nations system on indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, family, youth, aging, cooperatives. And our aim is to find ways to fight poverty, to promote decent jobs, inclusion and integration of all peoples, and reduce the gap of inequalities. So thank you very much for being here. I spoke even too much. I love talking. Uh, but it's time to actually ask our uh, panelists to, to share with us uh, their knowledge about the first panel, which is going, going to be moderated by um, Dennis Anderson, who is an estimated professor at the San Francis College, besides also presiding um, a very important uh, non-governmental organization accredited to ACOSO, because we wanted to involve not only the private sector, but also other stakeholders of the civil society. So, Dennis, I let you now lead the first panel. Um, this is meant not to be the typical panel. What we'd, we would like this panel to be is to be a discussion show. So, besides reading our notes, let's really try to make out of it um, something that is infotainment information and entertainment by sharing our knowledge to reach what is going to be the expected outcome of this afternoon that is in line with the 2030 agenda and its 17 goals. We want to aim to encourage multi-stakeholder partnerships. That's what we're aiming at, to establish partnerships at the end of this day to positively impact the prosperity and the well-being of vulnerable communities living in urban areas. Thank you, Dennis Anderson. The floor is yours. Um, Dennis, if you allow me, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but um, um, in, in the, in the, in your modera while moderating the panel, um, I think that first um, I should also ask, uh, not to be so selfish, but actually ask the honorable ambassadors here present to give also their opening remarks. Um, I, I do apologize. Oh, no, no, no. So um, the first ambassador um, that uh, will uh, share with us the opening remarks is um, Mr. Joan Adamson, deputy head of the EU delegation to the United Nations. And I would I, like also to thank the, the, the permanent missions to the UN of Antigua and Barbuda, Ecuador, the European Union, San Marino and the United Nations World Tourism Organization for supporting and sponsoring the event of this afternoon. Please. Um, 
Thank you very much, uh, Director Bath, and uh, thank you all uh, to all of you um, for being here this afternoon. I, re I really don't know how to um, follow up on that wonderful uh, sort of introduction we had. Uh, it's a difficult task, but I'm uh, very glad to be here with, with the co-sponsors to say, say a few words. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dessa and the other co-sponsors for organizing this event. Um, the title of the discussion provides fertile ground for futurologists mm -hmm. um, and those who aspire to making a, a better world for everybody. Uh, a favorite quote from Elon Musk neatly encapsulates the need to think big, but also to be realistic and grounded when he said, quote, I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact, end quote. <laughs> So uh, thinking big can lead, sometimes lead to overlooking the practical, everyday needs of people. The movement towards housing people in ever higher tower blocks, which began several decades ago in my own country of, of the UK, unwittingly inflicted damage on low-rise communities, and in some cases spawned crime and urban degradation. So listening to people should be at the core of all strategies to improve built spaces and communities. And that means hearing voices from all strands of society, young and old, persons with disabilities, those with and without families. Mm -hmm. It's also critical um, that all players come together in such endeavors. There's a role for the international community, for national and regional governments, for the private sector and civil society. Uh, the European Union has sought to put in place overarching frameworks, legislation and policies that support our member states in the realization of fairer societies. Here, here's a few examples. On disability, the European Disability Strategy mm -hmm. 2010 to 2020 aims to empower persons with disabilities to enjoy their full rights and benefit from participating in society on an equal basis with others. The strategy also aims to achieve effective implementation of the UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities by the EU. And just to note that the CRPD is the first international human rights convention to which the EU itself, as an institution, is a full state party. The strategy we have covers eight areas of action, accessibility, participation, equality, employment, education and training, social protection, health and external action. The EU is also working towards the adoption of a European Accessibility Act, which aims to improve the functioning of the internal market for accessibility-related products and services by removing barriers created by different legislation in different countries. So this should facilitate the work of companies and will bring benefits for both disabled and older people. The EU is at the forefront of efforts to accommodate ageing societies. Projections of ageing patterns make this a necessity. By the year 2020, people, over, uh, people aged 60 and over will comprise 20% mm -hmm. of the EU's population. And by 2070, the proportion of the population over 65 will increase from 19% today to 29%. This should not be seen from the viewpoint of how do we deal with these burdensome, burdensome old people. <laughs> Rather, the EU is placing an emphasis on active and healthy ageing. This ranging, ranges from policies to encourage a silver workforce, silver economy, to support uh, to the age-friendly age -friendly tourism. The EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights expressly enshrines the rights of the elderly. Article 25 reads, quote, the union recognizes and respects the rights of the elderly to lead a life of dignity and independence and to participate in social and cultural life. Societies that work for all also mean societies where all citizens can contribute without fear of discrimination or even worse. The EU is working towards that goal through its comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation, policies and funding. We know that progress is still needed as the vigilance of our national courts, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency all attest. So these are just some areas where action is important in endeavors to build future societies for all. And I look forward very much to hearing the diverse perspectives of the panels that will deliberate further on the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, open remarks.
pragmatic and to the point. <laughs> and now I would like to ask His Excellency the Ambassador Georgi um, Panayotov Bravo. Grazie. <laughs> from the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Bulgaria uh, to the UN. He has been with us since this morning and this tells us how much, you know, the, the relevance and importance Bulgaria gives to this topic. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You know, thank you very, very much for the warm words. Uh, just uh, I'd like to let everyone know that Bulgaria is, of course, co-sponsoring this event as, uh, as well. Um, dear colleagues, distinguished, distinguished guests, dear friends, this year's commemoration of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities gives us a unique opportunity to explore the link between sustainable tourism and inclusive urban development through a human rights perspective with the aim to forge fruitful partnerships between the public and private sectors and mobilize the different stakeholders to work together for ensuring the social inclusion and equal participation of persons with disabilities. Tourism is one of the world's largest economic sectors that creates jobs and boosts exports, thus bringing tremendous economic benefits which, if wisely utilized, could drive a positive social change, preserve cultural heritage, and save the environment. The tourism industry is an important source, source of economic growth for Bulgaria, my own country. With a total contribution to GDP of 12.8% and 11.9% to employment in 2016, Travel and tourism are closely linked to urban development and social inclusion. The diverse challenges many cities in the world are facing today, ranging, ranging from aging, climate change, and rising socioeconomic inequalities, can only be tackled through a people-centered and integrated approach with a focus on social inclusion in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the new Urban Agenda Habitat 3. The commitment of the 2030 Agenda to leave no one behind is an important human rights imperative deeply rooted in the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. The ambitious 2030 Agenda has for the first time included and recognized persons with disabilities as agents of development, which further strengthens the implementation of the CRPD. In view of that, as President of the Conference of States Parties to the CRPD, I would like to underline that the implementation of the SDGs from the perspective of the human rights of persons with disabilities in line with the CRPD is instrumental for achieving sustainable development whereby no one is left behind. In view of that, it is important to ensure that the rights of persons with disabilities are incorporated in the thematic discussions connected to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda including the review processes under the ECOSOC high-level political forum and all other UN processes. It is necessary also to explore ways for further strengthening the cooperation and partnership among state parties, United Nations entities, civil society and persons with disabilities to advance the implementation of the Convention with a view to achieving inclusive development. The concept of sustainable development which incorporates the model of inclusive urban development is closely related to the human rights agenda as it operationalizes the inherent link between the integration of the economic, environmental and social aspects and the human rights imperative with a view to ensure a people-centered approach to development. Integrated urban development can only be achieved if it takes into consideration the human rights of the most vulnerable and marginalized in our societies and includes persons with disabilities in the design, implementation and monitoring of policies at all levels, uh, levels while at the same time ensuring smart economic growth, adaptivity to changes and equal treatment. Bulgaria is strongly committed to the implementation of the Convention and is actively promoting the full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in society on an equal basis with others. Bulgarian legislation provides guarantees of non-discrimination and equal opportunities for all. All policies and programs on disability follow a human rights-based approach and are designed together with persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. 
The national strategy for the implementation of the CRPD for the period 2016-2020 outlines the specific role and responsibilities of the different government institutions, including with regard to inclusive urban development and sustainable tourism. The government of Bulgaria implements a number of programs aimed at improving the quality of life of persons with disabilities and ensuring their inclusion in society, which are closely linked to the model of integrated urban development successfully realized in Bulgaria. I would like to end my presentation with an example of a good practice from Bulgaria, which highlights social services in the community as a successful form of social inclusion of persons with disabilities with special focus on children. As part of the ongoing child care reform and the process of the institutionalization of children, all specialized institutions for children with disabilities in Bulgaria were closed in 2016. And all children with intellectual and physical disabilities were moved to modern, specially adapted accommodation with tailored support services in the community as part of the Childhood for All project. A network of integrated services in the community was established in Bulgaria, which introduced an innovative cross-sectoral model of providing support to children and their families with a special focus on children with disabilities. This ambitious plan was successfully realized with the financial and political support of the EU. Each child or young person is now able to access community-based support services according to their individual needs and have the opportunity to live with family or in a family-like environment. Children, young persons leaving the institutions have equal access to services and are cared for in the community, thus encouraging their successful inclusion in society. Thank you for your attention. Again, thank you very much. Practical examples of what can be done and what works. And that's what we want to discuss, be discussing today. Good examples, good practices of what works. I would like now to ask uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador Damiano Belletti from the Permanent Mission of San Marino to the United Nations to share also his thoughts and views. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Daniela. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, uh, I would like to take the floor of this event that San Marino has promptly co-sponsored and express my deep gratitude to the partners of this initiative, especially to the Zandia SPD, which first proposed and organized it. This initiative <coughs> aims at further detailing the commitment of, st of the states to implement concretely the content of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. San Marino was among the first countries to ratify the CRPD. The title of this side event, Toward Inclusive, Accessible and Resilient Societies, uh, makes al us also reflect on the value of the national measures undertaken to promote this important goal. I take the floor with great satisfaction in the awareness of San Marino's positive results and significant achievement in this direction in particular on the theme of the social dimension of sustainable tourism. In 2010, the San Marino Tourist Consortium realized a project to open our country to accessible tourism. Today, there are more and more people in San Marino who are devoting themselves to accessible tourism and the development of its potential because it is understood that it is an important sector of the tourist economy. Even after the entry into the UNESCO World Heritage Site, we thought that San Marino, despite its territory's special conformity, should be accessible to people with disabilities. What is the project? The project is divided into three phases, identification, information, and implementation. In the first phase, mapping of the most important areas of tourist, of tourist interest was made. Itineraries have been conceived that combine accessibility with tourism interest. The second phase consists in, in participating in conferences and workshops to update and make known the potential of San Marino. The third phase aims to involve as many potential people as possible, creating greater sensitivity to accessible tourism. In 2013, San Marino became part of the European Eden 
Destinations Network with the title European Destination of Excellence, 2013. In 2014, the first United Nations a World Tourism Organization Conference on Accessible Tourism in Europe was held in San Marino. With our project for accessible tourism, which is called San Marino for All, San Marino has entered the smart cities. We have developed various different supportive measures that over time have become landmarks for tourists who want to visit San Marino. In particular, we have a website that collects all useful information for visitors to San Marino, a paper travel guide that lists itineraries that are tourism accessible, menus and tourist information in Braille, along with a V4A world-class mapping of tourist locations. After the first years in which the project uh, has been mainly dedicated to motor disabilities, for over two years we have also been working on the needs of those with visual disabilities. As a testimony to the cultural value of the project, it is important to emphasize that the secondary school of San Marino has joined the project and at least uh, once a year invites the consortium managers to illustrate their activities to students who then develop small projects related to accessibility. This demonstrates that the culture of accessible hospitality is growing in San Marino. In 2016, the University of San Marino in Industrial Design, in collaboration with the Consortium and the Ministry of Tourism, organized a workshop dedicated to accessible tourism under the title San Marino for All Senses. From the workshop, we have created so many projects that we hope can soon be used by tourists to San Marino. From December 2016, thanks to the San Marino Tourism Office, our Republic has become the first state in the world to provide a tree ride, a special electric aid that may, may be added to a wheelchair and allow those with disabilities to visit the old town independently and without difficulties. I wanted to share this brief consideration to demonstrate how dear to San Marino is the theme of today's event in terms of concrete implementation measures. Indeed, my country has pointed to accessible tourism as a winning asset in the wider protection of the right of person with disability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before introducing the last speaker, a colleague from the World Tourism Organization, you might wonder, why tourism? Because this is the International Year of Tourism. So we thought that we wanted really to contribute together with colleagues from the World Tourism Organization on issues related to the social dimension of sustainable development and resilience and building the future societies we want. And tourism plays an amazing role there. Because if you want the tourists to visit places such as urban areas, then you need infrastructures that have to be welcoming, accessible, inclusive, usable for all, be that a person is old or young or has reduced the temporary mobility, broken leg, it's a temporary disability, right? Uh, or it is a temporary reduced mobility, disabling condition, or persons who have the traditional uh, disabilities, a CME or a sitting on the wheelchair, or other disabling conditions temporarily. Uh, pregnant women at the last month of pregnancy, for instance, they might have issues when it comes to traveling or finding places that you know are welcoming, but also people who love eating a lot, might also need some, uh, some uh, specific support. You know, sometimes I say, think of the little chair uh, you find in, in, in hotel rooms, uh, in the bathroom, right? It's a little kind of chair that you can pull up or down depending on the needs. Mm -hmm. That little chair can serve so many people, small children, they can sit there, and then the mothers or fathers help them to work themselves. A woman who's pregnant, and might have difficulties in washing her feet. Sorry, I'm talking about very, very basic things here. She uses that little chair in the shower in the, in the hotel room. An older person, the same thing, or somebody who is a little bit overweight, or somebody like me who cannot stand up. So that little chair 
is not for the room uh, accessible to persons with disabilities. That little chair serves as a huge variety of people. This is why I said at the very beginning that today in the afternoon we don't really want to focus only on persons with disabilities, but we want to see what persons with disabilities as agents of change, even without talking about them, are bringing to the society, are bringing to the future societies we want to build together. Now, my dear colleague, I would like to introduce you, um, but I thought it was important to highlight the relevance of tourism in what we try to achieve here at the United Nations. Also through tourism, we can really promote the social dimension of sustainable development. So I would like now to ask uh, Mr. Kazi Rahman, Deputy Special Representative of the UN World Tourism Organization here in New York as liaison office to share with us your thoughts and what the, the World Tourism Organization is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bass. Uh, indeed, I think you said you said it so, so you said it so uh, ably, so competently that you know the I think uh, to highlight the importance of what the tourism sector can contribute towards inclusiveness, uh, s social mobility, and building a fu building a future uh, for all. And uh, and indeed, this that, that is what sustainable tourism. Uh, needs to prom uh, aim, aim to, and UNWTO is working with all the other stakeholders in the tourism area to promote that, to, uh, to, uh, and to promote the uh, 2030 agenda, uh, which is actually for change and inclusiveness. Um, I think the importance that you attach to the tourism sector is, uh, is well taken. It is the biggest and fastest growing a sector in the uh, one of the biggest and fastest growing sectors of the of the world economy. Last year, uh, uh, the according to our uh, statistics, uh, a, a new record of 1.2 billion tourists crossed the international borders. And uh, 2017 is showing similar trend. By 2030, uh, it, the number is expected to reach 1.8 billion. And if, if we include the domestic tourists, um, we would have to multiply the figure by four. So, so this only highlights the importance of greater mobility and connectivity. And, and greater mobility, connectivity, information boom, new tourism products, better quality uh, of services. These, on the one hand, are leading to higher number of tourists, but also that is, this is something that needs to be continu continually improved and, 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 de and developed. The impressive, these impressive figures give, give an idea of the importance uh, that the tourism sector can play in the economy, in the society, in fostering equality and inclusion, in advancing the rights of persons with disabilities worldwide in order to contribute to an inclusive development for all. But a number of challenges need to, be, need to be taken into account in order to ensure that the transform, transformative force of tourism leaves only positive footprints behind. Without concern for sustainability, tourism can create detrimental impacts for the, for the environment, for the heritage, uh, cultural values of tourism destinations, and for the local population put high pressure on, on infrastructure, and you can ignore the plight of the people with disabilities and specific access requirements for more accessible environments, products, and services. Indeed, the social dimensions of tourism are key to sustainable development, uh, which was rightly uh, pointed out by the, uh, when the General Assembly adopted the resolution on International declaring, proclaiming International Year uh, of Sustainable Tourism uh, 2017. Uh, so UNWTO, I will focus uh, on a couple of areas in how we are working towards that, together with other uh, stakeholders. First, the code of the code of ethics. 
This conviction is at the heart of UNWTO's core policy uh, uh, document, the, the Global Code of Ethics for Tourism, which is a voluntary instrument adopted in 1999 by the UNWTO General Assembly and later acknowledged by the uh, United Nations General Assembly. The code is a unique instrument to guide policymakers, tourism service providers, and tourists alike in a responsible and sustainable development path. The code principles uh, advocate, advocate inter alia for the rights of workers and entrepreneurs in the tourism industry, the importance of tourism benefits reaching the host communities, and the removal of obstacles that hinder, that hinder the right of direct and personal access to tourism. Second, accessibility. In, in our view, tourism constitutes a human right which should be equally enjoyed by all segments of society. UNWTO therefore firmly believes that accessibility should be a central part of, the, of any responsible and sustainable tourism policy and business strategy and that it should be integrated into all tourism infrastructures, products and services. And enhanced accessibility further improves service quality and the overall tourism supply. It provides new jobs, brings investment, creates differentiated product innovation and helps the conversion of urban areas into smart cities. Yet at present the accessible tourism market is still relatively unknown. Visitors requirements are misunderstood and investments are exaggerated. Accessibility needs to be implemented throughout the entire tourism value chain. There is no use in adopting the last generation urban hotel or an, or an uh, airport terminal if there is no accessible vehicle to transport a customer from one point to another. Only one broken link in the delivery chain can hamper the whole tourist experience even or even make it impossible. UNWTO has been working to mainstream universal accessibility across the tourism sector in collaboration with civil society organizations of the disability community, public administrations and business sector. We have produced a series of awareness raising and guidance tool uh, no notably two sets of UNWTO recommendations on accessible tourism adopted by our General Assembly in 2013 and 2015. The first set of recommendations serves as a general mainstreaming framework for ensuring that people with disabilities have access to the built environment, the transportation system, information and communication channels, cultural and sports activities, and a wide range of public facilities and services that compose the tourism value chain. The second set of, set of recommendations provides a detailed guidance on making information and communication channels in tourism more accessible, including signage, printed, digital and audiovisual content, websites, apps, mobile devices, and interface terminal, uh, terminals used in travel and tourism. Besides these, these instruments, UNWTO has also published technical manuals and compilations of good practices targeting destinations and service suppliers. While these manuals provide know-how, systematic guidance and accessibility solutions, the series of good practice examples demonstrate that accessibility pays off the, uh, and that barriers can be successfully removed. Also since last year, UNWTO and its partners, the ONC Foundation and Spanish Standard, Standardiz Standardization Agency are working with the International Organization of Standardization, ISO, to develop an international standard on accessible tourism. This comprehensive standard, uh, this comprehensive standard will provide information on the key aspects of policy making strategic planning, design of infrastructure, products and services, and will be addressed to all stakeholders involved in the tourism supply chain, both from the, from the public and the private sector. Third, gender equality and youth empowerment. 
To be sustainable, tourism development needs to be more socially equal and inclusive, in particular, the participation of women and youth. Being a labor-intensive industry, the tourism sector provides numerous uh, opportunities uh, as an entry point for the, uh, to the workforce for skilled and unskilled workers. With one in 10 jobs in the world being created today in tourism, this sector represents a major source of employment for women, encourages a wide variety of entrepreneurship at small and micro enterprise level, ranging from accommodation, accommodation dining, handicrafts, uh, tour operations, tour guiding, and other associated retail outlets. According to the joint UNWTO, UN Women Global Report on Women in Tourism issued in 2010, women already make up a large proportion of the formal tourism workforce being well represented in the service and clerical, clerical level jobs, yet poorly represented at professional level. A second edition of this, of, this, of this report will be published in 2018 so as to, so as to update the data and, and to better understand the gaps and measures still needed to, be, to reach effective quality and non-discrimination. Fourth, indigenous population. Tourism is also well placed to support economic activity at rural community level especially in, in areas with rich natural and cultural assets. I refer here particularly to indigenous communities and to the potential benefits that tourism can offer in finding new ways of, of augmenting and diversifying their incomes. Indigenous peoples are characterized by some of the richest and most unique and diverse cultural expressions of humankind across our planet and are spiritually linked to traditional lands. These expressions represents, represent a clear pull factor for potential tourists. If managed responsibly and sustainably, indigenous tourism spurs, can spur uh, cultural interaction and revival, bolster employment, alleviate poverty, curb rural migration, empower local communities, especially women and youth, encourage tourism product diversification, allow people to retain their relationship with land and nurture a sense of pride. However, this type of tourism also raises some ethical, socio, uh, social economic, socio-economic and, and human rights related concerns that need to be addressed by all stakeholders. This is why UNWTO is developing a set of recommendations on the sustainable development of indigenous tourism. Aimed at tourism practitioners, these draft recommendations will guide tourism enterprises in their responsible operations on the ground while enabling indigenous communities that actually wish to open, open up tourism to grasp uh, all the opportunities that come along following a, a, a thorough consultation process. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think these are the few points that I wanted to present before you. Thank you. Well, thank you. This was rather a detailed uh, explanation and remarks, but I think that they were very useful because they tell us that there is so much to be discussed on the issue of the social dimension of sustainable development, also through the eyes of, uh, of tourism. We have two amazing panels. Um, I will ask the moderators to be a little bit um, less accommodating than me. <laughs> so that uh, we, we stick to, to the program. I would like uh, to tell you that the very first panel will be discussing about urban areas and how the private sector and, and the public sector together and with the civil society can really build to something important. We have representatives from the member states of the United Nations, such as uh, the, from Ecuador, but we also have representatives from major cities, uh, from the mayor's office of New York. Uh, we have a representative as well as from uh, ARMB, Microsoft, uh, 
and uh, from um, the uh, Hilton chain and the UN Global Compact, as well as other uh, communities such as the, the um, indigenous people's community. So, Dennis, it's in your hands. Dennis Anderson, as I said, uh, he will be chairing it. He is executive chair from the Center for Entrepreneurship, Institute of E-Government and Sustainability at the San Francis College. Thank you. And uh, before we start, maybe, so to allow panelists to leave the floor, we will have a one-minute video message. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where do I go? I can be <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's cue for me to start the program. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Director Bass for hosting this meeting. Okay. So, uh, now before I introduce the panel. Okay. Okay. Good? Okay. So, uh, F following the protocol, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the ambassador from Ecuador to uh, give a quick, uh, you know, remark. Then we will we'll get started together. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, distinguished friends, um, and, co and guests. Uh, I, uh, I know that the, the the main issue in this section was more. On the, on the measures taken in order to build in inclusive societies, cities for all. I would like to mention, since Ecuador was the country who held Habitat 3, the conference in October 2016, I'm going to refer briefly to this, um, to this part of a such important gathering of international community. First of all, it's my pleasure to participate as a panelist during this event on behalf of the government of Ecuador. Ecuador had an active part during the intergovernmental negotiations that concluded with the adoption of the new urban agenda, which has been already mentioned. And it was an honor for my country to host the Habitat Tree Conference in Quito in October 2016. It's important to highlight the innovative, transparent, and inclusive setting of the preparatory process leading to the conference and of the conference itself. The Habitat Tree Conference set a milestone because of the number and diversity of participants. National, subnational, and local governments were present, as well as parliamentarians, civil society, indigenous people, and local communities, the private sector, professionals and practitioners, the scientific and academic community, and other relevant stakeholders at all levels. More than 30,000 participants came from 167 countries and constituted the largest participation of civil society, stakeholders, and local authorities in the history of United Nations Conference. Ecuador, 
With ambitious new urban agenda, restates the importance of enhancing its implementation at all levels by all relevant stakeholders, ensuring that everyone benefits from urbanization and sustainable urban development, and focusing in particular on those in vulnerable situations through an adequate urban legislation, urban planning, and predictable financial plan. Consolidating and revitalizing effective and country-led public-private partnership is fundamental to eradicate poverty, combat growing inequality, and social and economic exclusion, as well as special segregation in cities and human settlements. For Ecuador, the realization of the right to the city is at the core of the new urban agenda, since Article 31 of our Constitution states that people have the right to full enjoyment of the city and public spaces under the principles of sustainability, social justice, respect for diverse cultural urban expressions, and the balance between rural and urban backgrounds. Promotes as well a particip participatory processes with inclusiveness, the social and environmental functions of the city, and the full exercise of freedoms and human rights. That's why we were so pleased by the recognition in paragraph 11 of the new urban agenda of a shared vision of cities for all, for the equal use and enjoyment of cities and human settlements with a view to promote inclusiveness and ensure that all inhabitants without discrimination are able to inhabit and produce just, safe, healthy, accessible, affordable, resilable and sustainable cities and human settlements to foster prosperity and quality of life for all. Regardless the specific points uh, which are taken uh, into account in the Convention for People with Disabilities, I would like to mention three aspects that the government of Ecuador consider as priorities. First of all, accessibility. The government of Ecuador, through the National Council for Disability, in coordination with the National Institute for Standardization and relevant public and private entities, industry, academia, consumers, and service sectors, aims to determine rules for planning and building in the urban setting, both in public and private spaces, coherent with accessibility requirements. Secondly, the access to information and communication technologies. We are committed to narrowing and closing gaps through the enhanced operationalization of effective public-public partnership models. And third, for, for us it's important urban mobility. We are committed with a rigorous observance of preferential parking zones for persons with disabilities, as well as appropriate traffic waivers during traffic restricted schedules. Strengthening public and private mass media campaigns to withdraw safety awareness is also, is also among our priorities. Another important aspect is accessible tourism. Along with the Federation of Ecuadorians with Physical Disabilities, the National Council for Disability and the Minister of Tourism have organized a training pilot program with nearly 200 representatives from private tourist operators, autonomous and decentralized local governments, and civil society representatives to maximize the inclusiveness criteria in the sector. For the government of Ecuador and the people of Ecuador, it was an honor to host Habitat Tree, we were confident in the everlasting legacy of the conference and the new Iran agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rosa. Um, so yesterday I received a phone call from one of the organi organizers and uh, he asked me, do you have any questions? Yeah, did you read everything you're supposed to read? I received a whole bunch of documents, you know. Uh, I said, well, yes, I did. I reviewed everything. You know, it's nothing new. And then he said, good. Don't make it boring. So uh, I'll, I'll try my best not to make it boring and try to make it interactive as possible. Uh, I, I'm excited that all panelists are here. Uh, but, you know, I think this is a serious topic, really serious topic. And how many of you actually live in city or urban area? Show hands. It looks like almost, almost everyone, right? Not almost everyone, there are a bunch of hands didn't go up. Nothing so <laughs> it's uh, about all of us, whether you raise your hand or not, the living in city is reality. 
living in uh, urban areas is reality today. And tomorrow, it's going to be more. There will be a lot more demands that we haven't even thought about in terms of services, in terms of access, in terms of everything you can possibly think about. The future is coming whether we like it or not. So how are we going to be prepared for the future? So uh, as a professor, I like to always start with some numbers, just to you know, highlight the importance of this gathering. You know, why are we here? You know, this is one more UN meeting. I've been to many, many UN meetings, but you know, what are we taking away from this meeting? Uh, you know, that's important to me, right? Important to you as well. So uh, I just did a little bit of a looking up. There were 370 million indigenous people. There are three, uh, 630 million, 65 and uh, older. One point, uh, one, over a billion people with disabilities. Uh, 1.9 billion youth, 14 and under. And billions, billions of people living in poverty. I'm not even talking about extreme poverty. Billions of people living in poverty. Yeah? And there are 3.7 billion women on, on this planet, but we are still struggling with the equality, right? Women and all these uh, people that I mentioned, they are crucial part of society and the cities. If we want the cities to function properly and we can all live together in harmony, we have to consider that everyone has an equal representation and we should all benefit from it as a society. So, the word urban population in, just here's another picture you should, I'd like you to have in your mind. In 1950, there were 746 million people. In 2014, there were about 3.9 billion out of 7.2 billion people living in urban areas. What, what does that say? People are moving into urban areas because everything that you want is there in some ways and more. Right? Accessibility, information, jobs, jobs particularly. Right? So this trend is continue, will continue. In 2050, it will reach 6.4 billion, according to the UN data. We'll be living in urban area. 37% growth will come from China, India, and Nigeria. These are major challenges for these big, big countries. Are they ready? Right? So, even the world population growth will continue to decrease. That's an interesting thing. The population will decrease. However, the, however, the, the world population will be over 9 billion by 2050. I think we have seen all this data. So UN data showed that today, 54% of the world population live in urban area. Okay? And they're expected to increase to 66% by 2050. This presents many challenges to everyone in this audience, panelists, everyone here, but this is particularly crucial for private sectors, civil societies, and governments, whether particularly local governments. They will have a more burden to carry, and federal governments, in some ways, less important than uh, urban or city governments. And that's an interesting thing to think we have to think about. That also means how do we reallocate resources? So that's something we gotta think about. Many cities are not built for future, we know that. They've been around for forever. If you look at Cairo, Mumbai, and all those cities, Beijing, they're not built for 22nd, 23rd century. So what are we gonna do about that, right? So resources are limited, fundamental resources including air, water, energy, food, housing, transportation, language, and technology, there will be a lot of pressures. The pressures will be on city governments, civil societies, and including private sectors. If they want to make money, they want the cities to be functional. They want cities to be healthy. Okay? So we want to build a future societies for all people, including low-income families, people with disabilities, indigenous people, and older population, and young people, and everyone that makes up a, a city. Now, but we don't want to forget those people who didn't raise hand. Not everyone will move into cities or urban areas. So how are we going to deliver access 
and service to those people who are left out or by choice or some of them are not by choice. Okay? So today we are fortunate to have a group of distinguished panelists from uh, city government, private sector, uh, civil societies, federal governments, uh, who can share their own experiences, exchange ideas that could advance UN's sustainable development goals, particularly goal number 11. Right? So during this panel, we'll explore three main questions around accessibility, accessibility, inclusion, local government challenges, and necessary resources to build future inclusive urban society. So uh, with that, I'd like to actually you know, dive into you know, dialogue with the, everyone here, uh, all the panelists. And one thing I would ask the panelists to think about is, th think about th three questions we have uh, in front of us in the context of provider and receiver. So in business, we have a buyer side and seller side. And in order to make this transa transaction work, you have to negotiate. So, and not, if it's a city, city government, it's probably giving, providing a service. So what kind of service would you provide to meet the challenges of next 50 years or 100 years to build the smart cities? So the first question we uh, will explore uh, is about how can civil society uh, and private sectors better support urban policymakers to ensure that cities are accessible to all. So I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Kali uh, Commissioner Kalishi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, fun. We've got to have fun, right? Yeah. All right, let's have some fun. All right, so um, getting people um, with disabilities around the city in a more efficient way is what um, people want. And um, government is held accountable for that. And uh, making cities accessible is something that government is supposed to do because that's what government's there for. And what really moves government to be able to do that is um, obviously money is certainly one of them, but it really is constituents. Looking at constituents, making sure that constituents have a voice in city government is really important. And not just a voice, but actually bringing people with disabilities into the conversation, making sure they have effective... Um, communication government and making sure that, that what their wants, needs, and concerns are, are implemented in government. And I really think advocacy is a big part of that. Thank you. Um, taking Victor's point further, I do think also the importance of technology. So I came into Airbnb via an acquisition of my company, Accommable. So we grew the company from scratch two years ago. And part of the outreach was through using social media, through using technology to reach out to people who felt that they never had a voice. And ultimately, if we are building new infrastructure and new societies, it is important that people who are not in the traditional mainstream, who do not feel that they've got a voice at the, at the right table, it is vital that those in power and in the sections of authority do use technology to reach out to people who may not have had that voice before. One thing that I would like to, to underscore, and for me it's extremely interesting, is the fact that during the conference, Habitat 3, it was a started an application with the Nippon Foundation, which is going to provide the people with disabilities, especially blind people, you know, to know the facilities, the accessibilities they got in the public spaces in the most, um, um, how say, um, the people, uh, the, the areas were more popular areas when you got, I mean, in order for them to know that are in reality the most uh, concurrent places in the cities, especially in the capital, are accessible to them. That, that is one thing that I, I uh, taking into account the, the, the things have been, that have been said. I think the important thing is the use of technology in order to provide real services. For, because usually there is a, a, lot, a lot of facilities that you take for granted, that in fact they are not. So one is the most important thing, maybe it's not really costly. Well, the project, I know it was around one, $1 million, but when you provide this service uh, freely to everyone, I mean, the impact and the multiplicator value is, is huge. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we're going to have some follow-up questions after this round. 
uh, concerning accessibility and uh, securing resources and also you know the examples of what techn how technologies could enable people to build a uh, better society so mr farmer I want to start by saying thank you to uh, Her Excellency, uh, the Ecuadorian Ambassador, for hosting uh, Fantastic Habitat 3 last year. I really enjoyed it, and I think that was so important to have those conversations um, in that setting, given that level of importance. And likewise, being here today, this conversation is really important. The fact this conversation is happening. And so I'd encourage everyone here to tweet about this, talk about it, bring this conversation to people who aren't in this room. There's, there are a couple of hashtags, IDPD, the other one's Future Societies for All, the number four. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. And the thing I'll say in response to the, the question that was laid out is that I, th I think collaboration across sectors is essential. Um, having worked in the public sector myself before coming to Microsoft several years ago, uh, and my, my role at Microsoft is to work with cities to be essentially a feedback loop to help them understand how they can use technology to solve hard social problems. So having seen this from both angles and having that perspective, I think it's so important because each sector of society, non-governmental organizations, public sector, private sector, has something to bring to bear. Uh, and likewise, I think we need to look at um, our different missions, our different goals, and see where the overlap is and see how they connect to one another. So for example, we, we think and talk about accessibility. Uh, but we also think and talk about smart cities. And we're also thinking and talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. These can't be separate silos. These can't be teams that work on these issues and don't talk to one another. We need to make sure they're connected because at the end of the day, if we want to reach the best solutions and create the best solutions using technology, we have to connect these different silos. Uh, and so one of the things that we did um, along those lines was earlier this year, we worked with the uh, local government here in New York City. We worked with uh, some other groups to put on Smart Cities NYC. It was uh, the first time New York had had a Smart Cities conference done at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in a pretty big way. And we made a choice from the beginning to focus on inclusion and accessibility as part of what a smart city is. Because a city's not that smart if it can't actually serve all of the people. Uh, so I'll start with that, and, and I'm looking forward to talking about some concrete examples as we go forward. Great. Ms. Kozo? Hi, thanks very much. Um, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, collaboration is, is essential, and especially with the private sector. Um, you know, cities, um, you know, currently 70% of today's global GDP is also generated in cities, and I think that's an important um, fact to note. Um, and so we can't really ignore the immense influence that the private sector has um, as employers, as developers, innovators, um, and as source of finance and investment. Um, so it's really important the business is at the table, and that's partially what the Global Compact, you know, tries to achieve is to bring a multi-stakeholder um, dialogue together. And maybe I could just offer one example um, from uh, our Global Compact's local network in Brazil of some efforts that I think are, are relevant to today's discussion. And it's a partnership um, that started with UNHCR and UN Women and our, our network in Brazil, as I said, is involving a number of businesses, including uh, Carrefour, uh, Facebook, Itaipu, uh, Renner Stores, IBM, Exo. I mean, the list goes on. There's quite a few that are involved now. But the idea was to um, facilitate job access for women refugees. Um, this was um, understood to be a, a major social challenge for the city. Um, and through the partnership, uh, 21 women have now secured jobs, and this has only been going on for a couple of years. And others have received um, professional training, support with their resumes, uh, networking opportunities. Um, but the partnership also looks at the capacity building for private sector organizations in terms of better understanding um, the legal issues around hiring refugees and, and overcoming some of the misconceptions there. Um, and also sensitizing the potential employers to the situation of women refugees. You know, if they show up for a job interview with their child, it's not because there's a lack of professional awareness, it's because they likely don't have a support system in place to be able to find care for their child at that time. So there's, um, there's some really interesting work that's, that's being done, and I think it, it really shows how the, the private sector can come together with the public sector and other entities to make a difference in this space. Thank you. Mr. Shavala? How come I'm um, I'd like to first uh, thank everybody who's invited us and who are hosting us, and also to 
give blessings and thanks to the Lenape people who are the original people of this land. Um, and I completely agree that collaboration with both government and business is incredibly essential, particularly for our population as indigenous people. Because although New York City has the largest indigenous population of any city in the United States, many people don't know that, last census was about 110,000, that's still only just over 1% of the population, right? So it's still a very tiny percentage of the population, even though numerically we can be strong, we have a strong vital community here. So often, going back to the mentioning constituencies, as a constituency, we might sometimes st seem statistically insignificant. I've even heard that word before among researchers, that sometimes people don't look to us as a constituency um, because we don't have, and I, I'll just be very blunt about this, we don't have voter power. Um, and so we can be often overlooked. Um, but I still think we bring much to the table. I think we bring much knowledge. And even Thomas Jefferson gave credit to indigenous people that were here in New York, the Haudenosaunee, for giving him insights into, and, and the founders of, of this country, insights into um, how to really bring together uh, a confederacy and how to lead a, um, a diverse nation. Um, because the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, had already been doing that for centuries. Um, so I think we have great knowledge to bring, even though we have a small population. Business as well, I think we have much um, that we can collaborate with business on, although I'll say that oftentimes when business collaborates with us, it's when they feel there's something specific that we intersect on in terms of philosophy or in terms of worldview, for instance, the environment. So we have a very good collaboration with Patagonia, because Patagonia considers as a, as a core of their of their business practices to be environmentally conscious and so it came to them wow indigenous people that's always been a core of their values that's always been a core of their philosophy so patagonia reached out to us as we've reached out to them and we've we formed a really a really what i consider beautiful collaboration but it's unusual for other businesses to come to that because they think well you know where where do we intersect in terms of values but we intersect in many many ways so i i would just always um, want to remind us all that we have many, many ways in which we intersect in terms of values, in terms of philosophy, in terms of what we can give to one another as we as we move forward. Thank you. Rick, thank you. I actually learned something new today. <laughs> as a New Yorker, I didn't know that. Thank you. Uh, that's great. So, you, you know, when I read this question, and accessibility is not just about physical accessibility. It's also about resources that allow people to build accessibility. So maybe quickly, the, I'd like to invite the panelists to talk about examples of that, how to secure resource and also provide adequate accessibility to the all citizens and, and the future population that will move into, uh, for example, New York City. You know, how, how are we doing that? So I, I think um, some concrete examples of this is um, resources are there, right? And when resources are there, we have to make sure that disability is included in that in the beginning. Um, something is um, that we put together in New York City is uh, a request for proposal. So we decide that we're going to do something in the city. Um, for instance, uh, Link NYC, you may see these um, machines up on the street. Um, those links um, are, have accessibility included in there from the beginning. Why? Because my office was there and involved in the process. What does it need to do? It needs to be a certain height. It needs to have uh, screen readers. It needs to be able to have um, video um, relay built in there so people w who are deaf can, can use that. So, um, and beacon technology, so wayfinding systems can be added to all this. So being able to build a lot of that stuff into the requ request for proposal from the beginning and ensuring it isn't just a boilerplate, you must comply with all codes and standards for people with disabilities. No, it's exactly what needs to be there, what needs to be put in there, and if we're not doing that, then the resources aren't allocated. So we do that in our website designs now, and we're talking about smart cities. We, we want to ensure that New York City is one of the leaders in accessible smart cities and moving that forward, um, as we heard from Microsoft say something about smart cities earlier. Now going over to Microsoft, so uh, you talked about the public-private sector partnership, right, PPP. So what kind of examples can you give us about working with the urban areas or city governments where you have seen an effective way of increasing accessibility? Absolutely. So, so I'd like to share two examples. One, uh, well, one, let me just start by saying I, I completely agree with Commissioner Cleese's point that it's so important to be accessible by design to bake accessibility in from the beginning. It's not an add-on. It's not an afterthought. It should be uh, the, the people who know this, these issues should be at the table from the beginning. Um, so one of the things that we announced at the Smart Cities NYC conference was the Smart Cities for All toolkit. And this was done in conjunction with 
G, uh, G3 ICT and uh, World Enabled. And um, it's, it's pretty simple at the end of the day. It's, it's essentially a checklist, instructions on how to ensure that whether you're building technology or buying technology uh, or communicating something through technology, how to ensure that you're making sure that whatever you're doing is accessible. Uh, and it's not realistic to expect that every single company or even every single municipality is going to have experts on their own staff. So it's important to be able to create these toolkits and then share them. So that's one example of working across sectors. An example of working specifically with the city is what we've done with Microsoft Translator. So Microsoft Translator is machine learning based voice to voice translation technology. And if you haven't checked out translation technology recently, uh, it's completely changed in the last couple of years because we've moved to deep neural networks, machine learning from the old version, which was statistical machine translation. Uh, quality has jumped. Uh, how quick and real time it can be is, is pretty amazing. So this is being used in boardrooms. It's being used in tourism settings, speaking of tourism today. Uh, but we said, you know, this is crazy. We should be using this for government services. And so we've worked with the mayor's office uh, on two settings. Uh, one, the engagement team that goes door to door to find out who's eligible for certain programs. Uh, and often someone does not speak English as a first language. Um, and then also for uh, ID cards, IDNYC. Mm -hmm. So someone comes in and does not speak English as a first language. And the other solutions that were out there were much clunkier, much more expensive for the city. And cost is actually, I think, an important thing to talk about and to recognize as a barrier. In that many organizations understand that sometimes there are laws on the books, sometimes there are simply policies, yet they don't comply because of the cost. And this is somewhere where technology can lower that from uh, something that is a barrier to entry and, and just simply makes uh, accessibility impossible to something where it really changes the game. Great. So I don't want this to be US centric, so I want to actually ask an ambassador here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to put on a spot here, but yeah. No, no, no. I don't want. I wanted to be on the spot either. No, yeah. but I just want to add a, yeah. a small, a small anecdote. Uh, I don't know if you are aware that this is the only conference room in the UN which is fully accessible for people in wheelchair. It's the only one. And in fact, we got during the plenary of the General Assembly, the high week, uh, high level week. Now, our president is in a wheelchair because he. He was the victim of a robbery 20 years ago. He is now in a wheelchair. And when we wanted, uh, we discussed with people at the GACM about uh, how my president is going to be uh, at the general debate on the plenary. And at the beginning, the, pre the, pre the, pre the president was by president some years ago. And well, in that quality, he came and he was seated beside the podium. And the response we got is, uh, we can be besides, well, he can be besides. I said, no, no way. He's going to be at the same level, seated behind the rostrum, seated as any other president, so you have to manage. And uh, I have to say that we were, the people at the beginning were sort of surprised. In the capital master plan of the UN, when it was renovated, they took up the asbestos and everything. Unfortunately, accessibility wasn't considered. It wasn't considered as it should be. So uh, we discussed, and at the end of the day, it was a very simple solution. It was a ramp, wooden ramp, nicely made. And I have to say that for us, it was a very meaningful, it was a tipping point, inflation point, and a very meaningful and emotional moment, the moment we, we could see our president sitting behind the room at the same level. The people, uh, say the general services, was so accommodating, so they felt so closely to their hearts that I, I was looking at that. The carpenter who built the ramp was with suit, a tie, and so proud of his work mm. when my president went to the, the rostrum to make the statement at the general debate. That's for me, maybe it's a small story, but the thing is here at the UN, we still don't have the, the full accessibility, but we hope that we can build up on this story and this moment in order to change things. And also, you see, we were discussing that the person said, but you know, this, uh, the rostrum is built on a platform, it's concrete. And I said, it's not, a, it's not a problem. Next year, maybe we can drill the concrete because it's a, a small lift. Mm -hmm. That could be also a, a mechanism for every one of us. I don't know, you are aware when you are be, be behind the podium at the rostrum, you need to be on a small stool because it's very high. So. Maybe we, we can build up on that and change things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, 
If I'm not mistaken, uh, Srin, you were interviewed by uh, Bloomberg or something? Because I was watching it, I think it was you, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I know you me. have uh, some good, great examples of this, accessibility, mm -hmm. and uh, from your business perspective, mm -hmm. right? But it, because we have a limited time, what I want to do is I'd like you to combine this with the next question, which is, uh, you know, how can socially responsible practices help urban areas become more inclusive and resilient? I think uh, you can bring your business practice into this question, then we will have another round, and hopefully we have enough time to get to other qu audience, of course, yes. Okay, please. So, first, taking uh, the ambassador's, taking the ambassador's point first. Um, about if you are going to drive that change, key organizations like the UN, government institutions, major academic institutions have to lead that change. They have to set the example. You know, if uh, the, the ambassador's president is on TV at home, you want people with disabilities to feel like, you know what, they can see the head of state on TV and, and rightfully have their, have their place uh, as, any, as any other leader. So I think firstly, if you are going to drive change, it has to come from the top and it has to come via a culture change. In terms of business specific, ultimately it comes down to investing in people. So, you know, part of the reason that Airbnb acquired us and brought my team across was because we had expertise. And that expertise was the product of, you know, several years of investment in people and making sure that we had the best talent out there in order to source accessible properties, accessible accommodation, but also the best talent to actually empower disabled entrepreneurs around the world to actually host their space. And you know, the other major aspect of business, I guess, coming from a company like Airbnb is you know, being able to use something like the sharing economy, which can be absolutely brilliant for disabled people because it gives, it gives access and flexibility to markets that traditional rigidity just does not work. So many of our employees and our talent could work for us because they could host their space whenever they had time. They didn't have to worry about transport issues getting into work every day. Or for example, when I came to San Francisco earlier this year, I emailed the community to ask for some you know, tourist information. How do I best get, uh, get around San Francisco? three of our users got in touch with me and drew out a Google map of how to best get around town. So, you know, that is entrepreneurship at play there. And I think business is, is really good at that. And I think, you know, companies like Airbnb and the team that I have at the helm, we are going to be hopefully at the heart of making that change. Great, thank you. Now, Lauren, uh, you global compact work, work with the global companies, many global companies. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, corporate social responsibility is one of the big things, principles of your organization. So maybe you can give us some example of uh, what things are happening in terms of socially responsible practices. Sure. No, I'm happy to. And I think, um, you know, as a starting point, this idea of acting responsibly is a must for all actors if we're going to talk about um, contributing to the SDGs and including SDG 11. Um, you know, I think that there, um, there's a risk that with the sustainable development goals that we could end up in a cherry picking situation where companies are looking for the easiest entry point and latching on to that and making a positive contribution, but also perhaps not thinking um, about their uh, responsibilities across, the, across sustainable development. And so this is why the Global Compact really tirelessly promotes a principle-based approach to sustainable development. Um, and we do have 10 principles that are derived from international declarations, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the ILO Declaration, Rio, et cetera, um, that provide companies with guidance on, on what corporate sustainability should mean. And this involves both you know, the respect dimension and minimum responsibilities, but also what companies can do to take positive action in support of, of the sustainable development goals. I think the other benefit of thinking through this lens is that you see the interconnection between, um, between the global goals. And for anybody that's working in the social space, we know how important this is. Um, so when we think about, for instance, the, some of the commitments that companies, that cities, and that others have made in terms of uh, climate change around um, the Paris Agreement, you know, how are these projects, you know, for one, um, being implemented in a way 
that respects international human rights, um, but also where are the opportunities to make these projects have a positive impact on inclusion? Um, so for instance, you know, do women, do um, persons with disabilities, other marginalized groups actually benefit from the job creation that's coming from smart cities? Um, it's a potential huge boom, or is a huge boom, and we saw this with the, you know, the, the tech industry boom years ago, and we all know that women, for instance, were left behind. So how do we avoid that from happening um, this time around? And maybe I'll just give you one example of a company that I think is thought in this lens a little bit. Um, Itaipu in Brazil, when they um, created an investment in electric cars, cars and a, it was a ride-sharing program that they were piloting, they also insisted on gender equal teams in creating that. So it's just, you know, it's adding this additional lens that really does help us maximize the impact. Thanks. That's great. Uh, Rick, I mean, I totally agree with you about the respect for environment. I think without that, we don't have a sustainability. So how are you reaching out to the community? A lot of times people are just focusing on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. You know, we're just hooked onto all these technologies and we're not really thinking about environmental impact. So can you talk to us a little bit about what your organization is able to do? Well, uh, again, you know, just speaking of core values, yeah. one, of the th one of the things that people may be very aware of is part of our just way of life and always has been is thinking, and there's different ways of saying this, but of seven generations. So as indigenous people, we're, we're never thinking of just our own selves. We're thinking seven generations out, and we're listening to our ancestors that came before us. And um, some of this seems oftentimes uh, quite basic and, and, and fairly fundamental, uh, but that's how good wisdom often is. And, uh, and so we feel that that's the way in which, you know, we, we share and we, you know, come to everything in that from that perspective. Um, and what we'd like to really be able to do is in some way, yes, and technology is still a, a vital part of how we communicate with all of our people. But a lot of it has to do with, are we able to come to the table where we know decision makers are going to be? And that's our biggest challenge is oftentimes indigenous people are not at the table with decision makers. Um, and we're left out. There's oftentimes uh, other people who are there who are representing other constituencies or other communities or other populations, but oftentimes we're, we're not, we're not the, at the table. Um, interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll even, I'll just say this outright, um, our current mayor, uh, Mayor de Blasio, was in fact the liaison to our organization, the American Indian Community House, when he was working with Mayor Dinkins. So it was nice to have that direct, that direct relationship um, with, with policymakers and decision makers. And I think that's, that's really important for us to deliver messages. We can, we can be on, as you say, the technology, the internet all day long, um, but if we can get the message to just a few of the right people, that oftentimes is gonna have a, a much greater influence as to what, you know, what's gonna happen in a, in a, in a city. So, so following up Rick, Victor, so how is the city functioning in terms of bringing all these stakeholders holders together to uh, address what Victor just said? Thank you. Um, lots of different ways. Um, we need people with disabilities involved in our community board processes. So we're, we have a, uh, an outreach to get them to involved and appointed on their community boards because that's important. We need that basic on level, um, street level. Uh, thing to get people involved. We have disability service facilitators and agencies throughout the city and in Department of Information Technology, um, Department of Transportation, Department of Parks and Recreation to really put together committees to find out what their needs and wants and concerns are. So it's that basic outreach that really gets them out there. And of course, social media has a big role to play. We use that effectively. We've been tweeting since we've been here. Um, thanks, John, for, for pointing that out. Um, because we want people to know that we're out and about, that, that we're moving things forward. And we're putting reports together, something called Accessible NYC. It's the state of persons with disabilities in New York City, and we tackle uh, six areas, transportation, um, health care, um, employment, because that's why people with disabilities are living in poverty, housing, um, and access to everything the city has to offer. And we have a report. It's on our website. Um, it's really great to, to download, and it really is a reflection of what the community wants. It's based on meetings that we have, parades that we have around, around the city, um, just to encourage people with disabilities to get involved in the process. Because we don't want anyone left behind, but if we're not involved in the process, we're not heard, and if we're not heard, things aren't put forward within city government. So now, John, Microsoft, well, I understand Microsoft has a huge footprint in terms of uh, corporate social responsibilities. 
Now, it's global, I understand that. Now, what are you, Microsoft is not going to be able to save the planet. So what are you doing in terms of bringing other, you aim high, you aim uh, high. Other, <laughs> other partners in the industry to solve the collectively? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, many discussions took place in the past. How do you collectively act together to provide accessibility to the, everyone? So I think one of, one of the absolute uh, essential aspects of this is we have to collaborate. Uh, and I think I alluded to that earlier when I was talking about the fact that not everybody can have the experts in-house. We need to be sharing expertise. So one of the things I think is really important for all of us to do, in addition to communicating the importance of these issues and that there are solutions, this isn't rocket surgery. That's, that's a joke. I'm keeping it light for <laughs> Director Boss over there. Um, is we, gotta, we have to walk the walk. We have to lead by example. And so a few years ago, Microsoft created an accessibility team. And that team has been helping the 100,000 employees of Microsoft that are all around the world um, create toolkits to understand if they're giving a PowerPoint presentation, if they're giving a speech, if they're having an event that we're hosting ourselves, how do we make sure that that's accessible to as broad a swath uh, of people as possible? Whatever their challenges and disabilities might be, whether they're physical, whether they're cognitive, whatever it might be. Uh, another thing that we've done is we created an autism uh, hiring program. So for people who are on the autism spectrum, uh, we created a special program that has a separate uh, process for identifying jobs where they might be likely to have the most success and a separate interview process to, again, allow them to show their skills and not go through a process that is simply not designed for them to shine. And that's been really successful. We've hired dozens of people through that process. And I think the last point I'm going to make here is that, yes, this is social good. It's corporate social responsibility. That's true. And I think everyone in this room probably would nod their head and say this is the right thing to do. And it is. But it's also good business. And I think this is an important point to make. We are creating teams that are more diverse, that are more skilled. We're actually accessing talent that our competitors are overlooking. And that is a great advantage for us as a business. And I think when we communicate this to everyone, we need to make sure that we make that point, that it's good business, that these more diverse teams are going to do better uh, in addition to the point that it's the right thing to do. So, Ambassador, um, here's a John who wants to come to you and say, we don't not only we want to do social good, but we want to make money in your country. How do you work with them? But I, I was thinking you have to come to Ecuador to see, first of all, you need to make a diagnosis about their needs. <laughs> and I, we can I, was, talk. <laughs> I was only there briefly last year, loved it, so and you I have will take to you up back. on the invitation. <laughs> well, no. This is how it works. You, know, you got to talk to each other. Okay. No, but uh, allow me to ask that the partnership along public and private sectors is, is cross-cutting in the UN. Now we have to, regarding sustainable development, I just was in a working lunch. Uh, we think we discussed this, how is the cost of sustainable development goals? And it's around three, $7 trillion. No, but also it's business. So I think maybe it's a matter of, first of all, set priorities. And then we can work on it. And Disability is a reasonable priority. Absolutely. That was a really good uh, answer to that. Now, just move to the next round here. It's all about tools. I think we all have tools. Uh, it's in your palm, actually. And uh, so tools are accessible now. So what are the necessary tools to mainstream inclusive urbanization policies in national policy frameworks? Well, simply put, what are we engaging in terms of digital tools, uh, non-digital tools, to work with everyone to build the future society we want that is inclusive, that includes all the population that I mentioned? So I'll start with the, uh, Victor. Well, we have to use every tool that we have. Um, and if we're thinking of the digital side, so again, social media does play a role. Um, it's important, especially with the millennials coming up, um, it's important. Um, data is, is certainly a tool. Uh, we have, uh, have 948,000 people with disabilities in New York City alone, and 60, um, uh, 6 million of them are, uh, come and visit our city every year, and uh, my colleague uh, Brian Grimaldi will be talking about that later. Um, so we have to exercise those tools, find out where people are, where they're living, um, be able to, to, to ensure that government is using the tools effectively. Um, 
a great example, again, um, it would, would, uh, John brought up is a G3 ICT. We work closely with them um, to, to talk about the toolkit they put forward on accessibility and develop own, own toolkits. Um, for instance, uh, we do a lot um, within our office to ensure that we work on making our um, social media accessible. People don't realize that you can tag a photo in Twitter and just be able to describe that photo so when a person with a visual disability is in there, they can understand what that, what's in that photo. So we do a lot of education around that and be able to use that to our toolkits. Great. Srin, now you work in many, many countries, right? Yes. So in not every, every country is uh, like a developed country. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with a different type of challenges uh, in of developing countries and whatnot. So what are the tools are you using to reach out to uh, people who do not have the same technologies or infrastructure? That's a really, really valid question. I think there you sort of, you have to sort of go the opposite. And I think rather than sort of putting my business hat on here, just as an everyday individual, I think one of the most important things is, is coming from a disability community is to make sure that those in local governments, that instead of going to tools, actually just being out there and sort of good old fashioned outreach work. Um, that no matter what sort of technology you use, there is still value in actually sort of getting out the office and going to these sort of going to these various places that you mentioned. So as you say, in, in, in places that are lesser developed, again, people just have to go out to, to sort of in whatever way they can to actually speak to people directly um, and sort of get that experience firsthand. And I think some of the changes we're seeing in the world at the moment are sort of various political events part of the re reason we're seeing that is because people don't feel that people in power are coming out to see them directly. So, you know, technology is useful and it's a tool and I love it. Equally, it can't be used as a replacement for some, just some good old fashioned conversation. That's very nice. Um, so I was just informed that we only have 10 minutes. I thought we were just warming up <laughs> and I was gonna go a, a couple more rounds here. I think I can really dive into technologies I love talking about autonomous mo uh, uh, automobiles and uh, AI and uh, machine learning and uh, uh, drones. This will be part of uh, urban societies. But w since we don't have time, but it will be unfair if, if you don't get to ask questions to the panelists. So I see already hands are going up there. So, uh, so uh, young lady over there. I just want to thank you. Uh, I'm Queen Mother Dr. DeLuise Blakely. I'm the Community Mayor of Harlem and the Ambassador of Goodwill to Africa. The question that's burning since we have a young person with us, uh, part of New Future Foundation here at the United Nation, is you have the elderly living longer. And when you talk about disability and you talk about sustainable uh, within our society uh, reaching those goals, and especially if you're talking about the urban community of New York City and give our best to our mayor, de Blasio, and our indigenous brother here comes from a principle and come from a place deep in the culture of a people. How would you define disability that is very clear, defined for us outside of the holistic physical uh, disability as we see it, and since the population is living longer, which is beyond one sphere of disability. I thank you. Rick, you want to take this first? And then Victor? Thank you so much. That's, that's, that's such a great question because it's what I think about all the time in terms of what our community oftentimes is challenged with. Certainly for us, we have an, a, a growing elder population, which as most people know in indigenous culture, elders are incredibly respected. Um, and they have the dual sort of challenge of both being able to access the wider world and probably not having as much access to the digital world. And, and we're a relational building community. And so just what my, my colleague was saying about how you need to get out, you need to outreach, it needs to be direct, direct kind of communication, direct sort of, um, you know, uh, relationship building with, with our community. And you can't, you can't bless with tobacco and sage through the internet. You just simply can't do that. You can't do what we just did with a drum in our, in our song, you know, through the internet. You can try, but it, it's not the same thing. Um, but to get more directly to your question, for many of our young people in particular, many people probably know this as well, that in, as indigenous people, we have the highest rate of suicide. 
um, and it's not regarded as a disability, but something happened along that way before suicide where that young person, where, where the highest rates are, they are among our young people, felt as if they were emotionally and spiritually disconnected from whatever we were offering. So there's no greater exclusion. There's no greater, there's no greater way than you, that you could say you are not included in this world than when someone feels as if their spiritual and, and emotional side is so empty that they need to leave this world. And so we need to start thinking about what is it that's happening among all people that's, that, you know, in, that in many ways they don't feel, they feel completely disconnected from their community, from the larger world, from what the, 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 all the sorts of experiences that are gonna, gonna probably provide them with a better life. And um, to me, that's, that's when you're, you're talking about prohibiting people from, from accessing the things that are most vital to what will give them a good life. So I think uh, we, is, there's a point where we put people um, in boxes, right? The first person's this person's that person. Um, and uh, we need to get away from that, number one, and really think about inclusivity, right? And when we're building and we're, and we're putting things together, inclusive environments are exactly what we need, right? It's, um, people don't identify with disability. It's hard to, to, to get people to do that. And people don't want to for lots of reasons because they don't want to be discriminated against. So that inclusivity and that design inclusivity, I think, is really important. And, and making sure that people are just one and, and no Nobody is, is left behind in that regard. Um, so I really think uh, it, it, it's all about connecting people and, and finding out what their needs and their wants are and building for, for one society. Okay. Any other qu questions from the audience? Yes. Um, my name is Jenny Naya. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I represent the Society for Accessible Travel and Hospitality. We work with tourism directly since 1976. Uh, one of the major things that we have found is more than the physical uh, barriers, the attitudinal barriers. So that is one very difficult uh, hurdle to uh, to be tackled. For example, I saw one of the best adapted rooms, uh, an accessible room in, uh, in Sri Lanka, and the manager said that room is used only maybe three or four days in a year because nobody wants to use the room as if you would catch some disease if you use that room. And that room is fabulous, like the chair that she was talking about. Oh, it's done so well. But the attitudinal, um, the attitude of people, even the hotel is fully booked, nobody wants that room. So how would we uh, tackle it more efficiently? Sri, and you want to tackle this? Yeah. Hospitality? <laughs> um, that's a really great question. It's a problem that I have personally encountered myself uh, from various hospitality operators. Um, I, I feel the frustration. I think the key thing for me has to be education-led and again at Airbnb part of my role and the role of my team is to be out there and try to convince people otherwise and actually that the, the views that they held are just wrong um, and be part of that conversation. So I think with the, the role that we have and being at the heart of this conversation I think has to be the way forward which is why you know we try to build as much profile about our work as we can. I mean, as, as, as John mentioned, you know, interviewed Bloomberg last week. If we are sort of raising this on the key sort of me media platforms and the message gets out, people don't see this as some weird, odd thing. They see that, you know, accessibility and accessible travel is not something to be scared of. Like, they're seeing this as a major commercial opportunity that's being validated by sort of the major media organizations. So we'll take two more questions, then I'm going to ask the panelists to quickly sum up a few words, in a few words. Uh, are there any questions? Any hands? Any, anywhere? Any questions? All right, so in that case, I'm going to ask the panelists to actually uh, just take 10 seconds to highlight things that, that you want to talk about or, or something that uh, moving forward that you want to recommend. This is an opportunity. Uh, a picture. Yep, thank you. I uh, just want to just enforce um, education. Um, 
it, making sure that people are educated about disability is really important, and employment. We need to start employing people with disabilities in the workplace. That changes the conversation because when, you're, when people with disabilities are among you, your perceptions change and you understand what their needs are. So in my 10 seconds, the two things will have to be culture change from the very top and organizations like the one very here leading by example. And secondly, inclusion, that getting disabled people involved in decision making. I would like to say that since Ecuador has hosted a conference with the Twitter, in fact, the new Iran agenda is a very good instrument. But it, it, it is not enough to have a very good instrument. We need the political willingness and we need the resources. And also we need to push for the change we want. Thank you. John. So first of all, I'd say it's really important to lead by example. And second of all, uh, collaboration. Collaboration across sectors, collaboration within sectors, businesses. We were just talking about uh, introducing Airbnb's accessibility team and, and ours at Microsoft. I think that kind of sharing is really important. And for anyone in the audience, I'd encourage you, if you think it's relevant, to check out the Smart Cities for All toolkit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just offer that I think, um, you know, we could look at businesses sometimes being ahead of the curve when it comes to diversity and inclusion because, to John's point, they know that it is good business sense. Um, so whether this means, um, you know, thinking about the diverse guests that are coming to your hotel or, you know, I saw a presentation by L'Oreal talking about how everybody has different types of hair and if they want to have a large customer base, they need to be thinking about the different types of hair. Or, um, you know, a group we haven't covered today, LGBTI, um, that represents a global purchasing power of $3.7 trillion a year. Business has a reason to be invested in this. So when government and other actors are looking for allies, the private sector actually makes a, a lot of sense and oft often offers a lot of um, valuable data and information. Yeah, we, uh, we really need support and, and allies in government and, and private sector. And I'll just end with an anecdote. The fact that we are very low resourced um, in a very expensive city like New York City to provide a community space for our, for our very unique community, which is populated all the time. And we have events of all kinds. We have cultural activities of all kinds. We have spiritual activities of all kinds. In order for us to sustain that, just a space in New York City is very expensive. So we end up having to find a place that is as cheap as we can find, basically, just to put it, again, very, very bluntly, um, which means accessibility is oftentimes uh, what, what, what goes out the window. So our, just as, an, again, anecdotally, our elevator is always broken in our building. So a lot of our elders, including who's, um, Zubin, who's saying, um, for you to start this this program oftentimes cannot get to our space as as many of our elders and many of our folks who need access can't get there because the elevator's broken and the elevator is broken in the building because of, because it's a, 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 a space that's low what we can afford right now and it's in New York City and yes it's theoretically accessible but but in, in reality it's not so we, we really always need more resource and support from allies usually when I um chair or moderate a, a panel like this, I like to leave with some sort of like a, you know, feeling of finished. But, you know, listening to the panelists here today, I think the dialogue has just begun. It's just the beginning of this dialogue, and we have to build from this dialogue. And there's so much we can do together, but we haven't even touched on all the interesting, important things that we could have talked about, the technologies and the tools, you know, all people. Everyone has different issues, by the way. And people, I don't want to lump them all together. They are all different things that we have to address. So I, I like to leave that, uh, leave it with that note that we have to start uh, talking to each other uh, and understand each other better so that we can uh, build a better future. I, I want to thank the panelists for contribution and thank you all for coming. Thank you.
Okay, we'll uh, start in a minute and uh, please the panelists to take uh, their seats. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, we will start our uh, second panel, and uh, we'll get uh, straight uh, into the, the discussion as soon as possible. Uh, for panelists, I will uh, ask uh, each one of them to make a short introductory statement for two minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll start. But before we start, uh, two years ago, in the, in the very same building, the United Nations 70th General Assembly has passed a historic uh, uh, declaration and commitment for the 193 member states, which is namely the Sustainable Development Goals, later known as the Global Goals, which is right behind me. Uh, at the same year, uh, the General Assembly declared that 2017 will be uh, the International Year of Sustainable Development sustainable tourism for development. Both uh, declaration and commitment have at the core of it is social inclusiveness and prosperity. If we take the first goal in the SDGs, which is eradication of poverty. Eradication of poverty can come in many forms, but the, 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 the heart of it is without jobs, we won't have people moving uh, up the social and economic uh, scale. Without uh, any further ado, I will start introducing our distinguished panel. We have a wonderful panel today, a mix between uh, and experiences between uh, private and public sector, academia and government, which I'm very uh, privileged to, to moderate it. Uh, I'll start first with His Excellency Dr. Walton Alfonso Webson. He's the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda at the United Nations. Uh, prior uh, to uh, becoming the, the uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative, he was the former Director of Perkins International, where his duties included managing the development of educational programs throughout the five global regions around the world, where he, Perkins currently uh, works. In addition, he had responsibility for the creation and management and staff development training for international organizations and governments in the field of services uh, to the blind and visually impaired. Welcome to the panel, Ambassador. Uh, our second guest is Brian Grimaldi. He is the uh, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of NYC and Company, the official destination marketing uh, organization for the uh, City of New York. Then we have Daniela Foster, a Senior Director of Global Corporate Responsibility at Hilton Worldwide. And uh, she has quite an interesting uh, resume. Uh, she moved from uh, government uh, and uh, diplomacy into the uh, field of uh, where she was championing the, the field of public-private uh, partnerships uh, into the uh, uh, global uh, corporate responsibility and public engagement for private sector. Welcome, Daniela. And then we have uh, Clark Stevens. He's the Director of Government Affairs and Strategic Partnership at Airbnb. Uh, Clark have uh, worked both in government, where he served as uh, the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs uh, at the Devel Department of Homeland Security, as well as he worked as a chief spokesperson uh, at the White House during the Obama administration. Uh, Tui Shortland, uh, and uh, I see uh, Tui's business model is quite innovative. This is the first time I got an uh, encounter uh, with a, an entrepreneur who is involved with the indigenous uh, tourism, and that's probably a new term 
even for the tourism practitioner uh, to use uh, from a long time. And last but not least, uh, Lynn uh, Maynard, uh, she is the academic director and a clini clinical associate professor at the Jonathan M. Tisch Center for S Hospitality and Tourism at the New York University. Uh, without any uh, further ado, uh, we will have each of the panelists take uh, two to three minutes to uh, have an opening statement. Uh, Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours. Moderator. Um, first, let me um, thank the organizers of this um, event for bringing us together to discuss a very important topic and um, a topic for me where we have moved and need to continue to move the discussion on disability from rhetoric to action. So it's very important to me that we have picked a topic that can address goals that would move towards the achievement of the SDGs and the part that persons with disability hold within that. I also want to take the opportunity to wish all um, happy disability, International Disability Day as it comes before us. It's a very exciting moment each time it comes around. I, finally, Mr. Chairman, before I get into it, I have to apologize that I will have to run, so I would say a lot of controversial things and then I can leave. No, I won't. <laughs> um, I have to leave early because I'm traveling early in the morning and I have to get back to my office to get a couple of things done. So my apologies for this. Um, I wanted to make three quick points to look at three quick things. One is, the, as, as introduced by the uh, moderator, the social integration of, of, of vulnerability such as we see um, faces youths, older persons, persons with disability, and indigenous people are significant, um, that we have significant challenges that we must overcome if we are to achieve the SDGs. This is locked, of course, if we leave it untouched, we then do, do not address the question of poverty. I'll come back to that quickly. Then I need then the question of full employment, or employment and decent work for all, which is another call within the social de development um, agenda and another plea for persons with disability to find decent work in, again, addressing the question of poverty. And then I ask myself the question, um, uh, with, with, and, and, and I'd like to explore very briefly the, the, the question of the factors that make communities inclusive and um, uh, or, or an experience for a vacation enjoyable for, un, um, for persons with disabilities. Let me quickly begin with the first one. And I know the moderator says two minutes, but I will ask for another two minutes because I'm going to run. <laughs> So often, when I'm asked that question, when I'm asked to discuss um, living conditions where persons with disability, the circumstances, I begin by first reflecting on the need of not persons with disability, but anybody. One of the questions I ask, I, and, and, and I asked my wife last night, I said, when you are getting us ready for vacation, what are the questions you ask? because it's the same questions I ask about if there's a person with disability. Of course, what is the climate? What, where is the locality? What is the, the attraction there? How can we access, access them? And then, of course, what is the quality of service and the, how is the infrastructure? into which we are going. These are questions that we all ask, and therefore, for persons with disability, these are questions we must ask and then as, and, and examine those answers as we, as, we, as we move forward to either define the vocation or to define the communities or cities into which we live. Communities must respond to these, we must respond to these questions if we are going to address the question. We have heard a lot from Habitat Three, for the need for decent um, housing and new communities, new cities, new urban environment cities, and, and those questions are central. Answering those questions above are central if we are going to change the paradigm and change the dynamics around the inclusion of persons with disabilities 
and on bringing persons with disabilities into the global community so that we can live in cities like all other persons and participate in the activities of those cities. We must begin to answer those above and begin to address those in the light of making life, livelihood um, more meaningful and exciting. In view of all of that, we have to begin to change the question from just saying what is access for the person with disability. We have to think of not just the persons with disabilities as we do with youths, we have to think of families. We must include families within the context of where we are going to find to live or where we are going to vacation. Families are an integral part of that question and therefore must be an integral part of that, of the answers. Persons with disabilities live with families and, uh, and, and, and it is within that context that all, uh, all questions around disability should be looked at and answered. The question of accessibility. Often, accessibility is, is, is defined or reduced to a question only around physical structures. I think we have to think of accessibility in a broader bundle, a broader context of, of questions and information. We cannot simply say accessibility only around physical barriers and physical structures. We have to, as I say, rope accessibility into the social environment as well. We have to begin to ask, uh, we have to begin to look at the social structures in the communities. And that's why, I, as I said above, families are so important. We have to look at those social structures as part of the concept of access. So the concept of access must be broadened so that we can understand that, and, and, and that concept itself is inclusive. Moving quickly to the question of, of, of employment. I think the tourist industry is, is, a, is a great industry for create, tourist and service industry is a great industry for creating um, employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. For two reasons, one, the, tourist, the, the persons with disabilities, including el persons who are older, is an enormous number of people. We've told that there are more than, one, more than a billion persons with disabilities. That's a large market. Older persons with disabilities, especially the boomers as they get older, have more money than youths. It's a market, therefore, that you cannot leave out in sensible business thinking. So we have to begin to think, as we think of the environment that we are creating to attract a new kind of tourism, that this population has resources. And that this population, especially in the West, in the developed societies, has resources, and resources that can be spent to expand serve to expand employment. Not only do they have economic resources, many have cap capacity that they can use towards the service industry and the, 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 and the broader tourist industry. So exploring that capacity is to my mind critical. And, and moving, th that moves us into the question of, of addressing poverty. Well, if we are going to address the question of poverty, then we got to find meaningful work and employment. And I think the tourist industry is probably, probably the, 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 the industry with the largest opportunity for creating employment because the, the, the industry has boundaries beyond, beyond one type of operation. Your opportunities for work in the tourist industry can move from self-employment to em employment within a larger chain or hotels, etc. And therefore, the opportunities that can be created for persons with disabilities is unlimited if given the chance. I, I, I want to end there, be, being mindful of the time, and I wish we had the opportunity to explore some of these thoughts. But I want to end by saying 
the I think on the horizon is a new dawn and that the 2030 agenda creates this, this magical formula for us for leaving no one behind. And if we take that seriously, if we take that mantra seriously, then the opportunities for persons with disability ahead of us can be bright. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, before you leave, you, you, I will just uh, ask for one question. Uh, you, 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 you spoke about the economic imp uh, uh, opportunity and the family. How can developed countries, developing countries, get on the opportunity of creating the facilities needed for uh, uh, people with disabilities to attract them to, to their destinations? And, w and is there any uh, preparation to pursue that uh, in the very near uh, future? Thank you. I think, I think that, that, that in, in terms of my part of the world, the Caribbean, that the answer to that is, lies in what I just said. Our main industry is tourism. Our linkage between developed countries and developing countries is about the, 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 the wealthy people in, developing, in developed countries coming to our islands to build hotels. And therefore, every accommodation built should be built with the facilities to um, accommodate persons with disability. And we should, uh, so for the, in the developing country, our role is to make legislation, to make it happen. As we partner with the rich persons from developed societies who come to our countries to build hotels. Our, in my country just built its new airport and it's totally accessible. My prime minister makes a joke to say it even has a place where our guide dogs can be taken easily. Because it's a fact. And it was built with support from a developed society, a developed country. China helped us in building this. So it is that partnership between developed and developing societies that will have that we have to continue to to to, to expand on and using the input of my good colleague or friend colleague here from Hilton. That's the message. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, just as a quick uh, reminder, uh, this panel is uh, broadcasted around the world and as well as through the web uh, on webtv.un.org. Uh, please, for those who are using uh, Twitter, the hashtags are IDPD, and another hashtag is Future Societies with number four, all future societies for all thank you and now we uh, move ahead with our uh, panelists uh, mr grimaldi the floor is yours thank you mr chairman i'm happy to be here and thank you for putting together this important conference you know the city of new york last year hosted more than 60 million visitors from around the world uh, 13 million or so from the international community and the balance domestically this year, we're on par to host nearly 62 million. Uh, and our visitors uh, add to the vibrancy of the city, and they contribute to employment here. Uh, and their economic impact is, is second to none. Uh, $41 billion in direct spending, $61 billion in economic impact. Uh, that's an enormous amount of jobs and taxes. There are 383,000 jobs in the tourism sector in New York. Um, across a broad spectrum with an average wage of about $60,000, uh, which beats a lot of the other sectors that are in the New York City economy. Uh, in terms of uh, its importance, uh, those jobs need to be filled and they're good ladders up to a career in tourism in terms of moving folks from entry-level positions to middle management and then senior positions. Uh, the city has done a good job of uh, educating youth um, at the high school level, through career technical education, there are roughly 1,300 students enrolled now with a hospitality focus and giving them content that includes issues of accessibility and putting them in the community and getting them to learn more about the needs of our guests. Um, you have a guest and that guest has a great experience and they return to their home nation and they are the best marketing tool that you have because they tell two people who tell two people who tell ten people. 
And uh, that's generally how we do it here. Uh, NYC and Company is structured as a public-private partnership. We're a traditional trade association, a destination marketing organization. We have a contract to provide the city a certain amount of tourism marketing services, and we work with partners like Commissioner Felice's office on things like the accessibility guide. Um, uh, Victor was critical in helping NYC and Company um, in terms of content development for our website and our digital platforms and getting the accessibility information front and center. Uh, in preparing for this conference, you know, we the, triaged our website and we pulled up a few hotel listings and one of them we pulled up and front and center are all the accessibility options that are available to the guest. And with the growth of the hotel sector in this city, you know, we've added more hotel rooms in the city of New York since 2007 than is currently housed in the city of San Francisco. Um, some 40,000 units in the last 10 years. Uh, so by the end of this year, there'll be 120,000 units in active inventory. Um, and our partners in the hotel community have been great, and the new properties that have come online are really state-of-the-art. So again, thank you for putting this together, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, and now we move to Daniela Foster from Hilton Worldwide. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I, I have to say I've been listening to the sessions and um, I'm so inspired and so many of the things that I want to talk about. Now I want to talk about different things with you all. Um, as I was coming up today and, and I've been, been here many times before, one of the things that I was thinking about is how interconnected our societies are today, how travel is a powerful tool. And in particular, it's a powerful tool for people-to-people -people connections and building mutual understanding and inclusion. And I think building mutual understanding really is at the heart of so much of what we're talking about today because that's part of how we foster a more inclusive economy. So at Hilton, I'm one of um, over 350,000 team members around the world that works for, for Hilton. We're in over 105 um, uh, countries. And one of the things that I'm always thinking about, and that I know our teams are always thinking about, is that the success of our business is completely linked to the success of our local communities. So when, when a property is in a community, it's part of an entire ecosystem. It's not just sort of a temporary accommodation. We are there and invested. And so I think we see that across the board from the local owners that we partner with to build our hotels to the local talent that we work with that helps to make the, the hotel operate to the local communities and the businesses we support through our supply chain and through on, on through the, to the guests that we serve. It's all part of a value chain in an ecosystem. And I think that's incredibly important because all of us in this room here today, we're all part of an ecosystem of travel and tourism in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's how you got here today, whether it's where you're going to tomorrow, we are all part of this ecosystem. So I firmly believe that fostering a more inclusive economy is in intricately linked to sustainable and responsible travel and tourism. So there are so many issues um, that I could talk to you about today, but there's, there's one I just want to start to hone in on, and that's this issue of um, unemployment and, in particular, youth unemployment. So by 2027, if we just look at the numbers, the travel and tourism industry is projected to support 380 million that's 380 million jobs globally. That's one of nine jobs. It's the world's largest employer. Just think about that for a second. And 86 million new jobs, new jobs that do not exist today, will be added to the global economy in less than a decade. Now, if you take that and contrast that with another trend that's happening simultaneously, and that is youth unemployment. Youth today account for over half of the world's population. It's the, the largest generation in human history. But they also have another unenviable record. And that is that they're facing the highest, the highest unemployment rate in history. It's an astonishing 71 million young people that are looking for work. 
And we know that many young people today don't have the minimum basic skills that they need to be gainfully employed. We also know that young people are three times more likely to be unemployed than adults. And when you look at uh, vulnerable populations, of course, those numbers are gonna increase. So what are we thinking about here? You know, th from Hilton's perspective, we firmly believe that we have an obligation and a business interest um, to invest in, in today's youth. Um, and we've been taking this seriously, so just a, a couple of things on our radar. In 2014, we committed to connect, prepare, or employ one million young people by 2019. It's been keeping us busy. Um, we've reached 700 young, 700,000 young people to date, and increasingly, we are focused on vulnerable populations. So um, persons with disabilities, we have a number of um, programs to bring persons with disabilities into the workforce and into the fold, uh, women and girls, the list goes on and on. Um, I'm gonna stop there today for, for right now, but I, but I do wanna say I think the travel and tourism industry is incredibly powerful because from our perspective in the hospi hospitality sector, we're flexible on how people get to us. So the barrier to entry to come into hospitality is really low and we're doing everything that we can to close that gap. So I'm gonna stop there for now because there's so many other Thank things we you. can talk about. <laughs> uh, Tui, please uh, go ahead. Uh. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to give thanks to uh, those who gave prayer and blessings to open our session today and to the indigenous peoples of these lands and to our hosts. It's a, a, a pleasure to be here, a humbling pleasure to be here today. Uh, I've come all the way from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I haven't been here 24 hours and I've er already met some very phenomenal people um, committed to the development <laughs> goals alongside many of us, so thank you very much. Um, I'll start out by talking a little bit about Native XP. Uh, it is a global indigenous tourism initiative so uh, you can go on to gonativexp.com and book Indigenous authentic experiences. So uh, we came up with this concept largely because of a need to end poverty within our communities. I come from the far north of New Zealand, one of the most uh, marginalised Indigenous communities, and within our wider organisation we run a charter school and six early childhood centres. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we have around 400 children uh, all running around us, and they are a reminder to us that we need to lift our people from poverty. So uh, our co-founding uh, team are made up 100% Indigenous. Uh, we're also 50% uh, women and 66 or so percent youth. So uh, two also of our most senior positions are held by women, indigenous women. Uh, part also of uh, been considering the development goals. Uh, the online platform ensures the free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples in their engagement. We also encourage the respect, protection, and promotion of traditional knowledge and are embedding those authentic, appropriate policies within uh, the engagement of the platform. Uh, we just launched on October 28th, so not even two months old yet, and we've already had a phenomenal amount of interest from Indigenous hosts uh, from over 20 different countries. So right now uh, we are working on partnerships, uh, regional partnerships and in-country partnerships because we really need to ensure that we're supporting our hosts appropriately, uh, that they still need to go through a registration process to ensure that they're providing amazing experiences. And um, so we're doing that with partners such as Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, um, uh, RIPON in Russia, who represent all the indigenous peoples across Russia. Um, but perhaps I'll talk a little bit more about that as I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now to uh, Clark Stevens, uh, Airbnb. Great. Is yours. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, thank you um, for every, uh, everyone for being here today. Thank you for the invitation to participate. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be talking about these important issues uh, with such an esteemed group. Um, for those who don't know, Airbnb is a platform that allows you to share the home in which you live. Uh, in the last nine years since it was created, um, it uh, has listings in 191 countries around the world, uh, 65,000 cities. Um, we obviously are very um, excited and, and focused on the opportunity that tourism provides, uh, not only because it's our focus, but, but more because it provides such an incredible economic opportunity uh, for so many people all around the world. Um, we've heard from uh, many different uh, people today about the power of tourism. Um, it is 10% of the global GDP. It is something that is growing. Um, not only is it growing, however, in the opportunity that provides, that growth is outsized in emerging economies. It's growing twice as fast, according to UNWTO, in emerging economies uh, than it is in developed economies. What does that mean for Airbnb? Um, we've done uh, a series of studies and, in fact, just this week released a, a new study that showed by 2030, 400 million uh, international travelers will travel to um, emerging economies on Airbnb. They'll stay with 28 million hosts in those countries. Um, when you add to that the fact that the host, uh, an Airbnb host keeps 97% of the listing price that they charge, there's an incredible economic opportunity taking place uh, in those communities all around the world. Uh, and we really want to make sure that um, as tourism grows, all of these communities and economies can continue to benefit uh, in a way that ensures that tourism is good for everybody. It's inclusive. It's raising the bar uh, for many people who, frankly, historically have not been able to benefit from tourism. Um, being able to uh, take money and put it towards things like housing and other, uh, you know, ordinary costs that people deal with every day. So we're very um, focused about that and very excited to be talking about that today. Um, I also just want to say that um, um, we are, um, we've seen incredible growth um, uh, as it relates to uh, people over 60. Um, that's our fastest growing group of hosts um, on the platform. Um, and since our founding, uh, women have earned over $10 billion on Airbnb, supporting uh, more than 50,000 uh, female entrepreneurs. Um, that's an area we've been particularly focused in places like India uh, and Africa, uh, working particularly close with certain partners there. Um, I'll stop there and um, look forward to the conversation. We can talk more about how, uh, how we're having an impact. Thank you, Clark. And now, uh, Lynn, please. The, the voice of reason and academia. Oh, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, thank you very much once again. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, congratulations to the organizers. Uh, this is a very important topic for us at NYU, um, obviously because our students are part of the next group of professionals that will enter this industry. Um, for them, many of them are in the room actually today. Um, for them, these goals are very much ingrained in how they look at the world. So it's great to see that um, it's, it's much more embedded in their thinking than it has been in previous generations. Um, on a personal level, I think it's, it's a great pleasure to be here because this has always been my research focus. Um, I want to just to make one very quick point is that not only should we look at the economic benefits of tourism and the integration of people into the workforce, there's also a social benefit to tourism. Um, traveling is so much part of what makes you a, an active member of society, that being excluded from that because either you can't get around easily or you have an illness or maybe you just don't have a lot of money um, feels very isolating. And there's a lot of great initiatives that maybe we'll come to later that can help overcome that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is all very uh, compelling numbers. Uh, numbers not only in the millions or hundreds of millions, but in the billions of dollars. The, the, uh, the, the, this, this, this fear that the tourism industry operates is a truly global. The opportunities it creates, it's real. It's not only directed towards the, the tourism establishments, whether it is a hotel or transportation, but it, it goes across the various segments of the society. If we look to any resort operating in anywhere, you will find that from the farmer in the fields to the high-tech uh, company benefit from the existence of this uh, enterprise. And now with uh, the new economy and the new technology of Airbnb and the diversification of the tourism product, uh, we have now the indigenous experiences, and it's, 
It was an information uh, for me that uh, expands to 20 different countries. Uh, the, the amount of opportunity is immense. With this backdrop, I will start asking uh, our panelists, how can in inclusive and accessible tourism, and let me uh, highlight accessible tourism, help towards contributing towards the strengthening of resilience of people living in poverty if we are aiming to eradicate uh, poverty and those vulnerable situations around the world, not only in New York City, not only in uh, Paris, but around the world. I will start with uh, Lynn. Please give me your perspective on that. Of course, thank you. Um, so first of all, the, um, the visitor who's looking for an accessible tourism product is often a very loyal visitor. Um, I'm often a little bit worried that we represent them as very high spending. Not everyone is, unfortunately. Some people um, with disabilities have a lot of resources, others do not. But what we do know is that they want to spend their resources on travel. And once they find a provider that they like, they tend to go back to that same provider time and time again. And they tend to also be very vocal and tell other people about um, the tourism providers that do a good job. So just in terms of building a loyal customer base and a customer base that is new, that is not going to run to the latest new thing every time, um, is an incredible benefit for destinations and businesses. Let me try to get the destination perspective. Uh, Brian, uh, New York City is uh, one of the top uh, ranked tourist destinations around the world. Uh, there was actually a couple of days ago, there was a report that even the Broadway uh, theaters are becoming now accessible for the uh, visually and uh, hearing uh, impaired. Yes. How can New York City uh, expand uh, on the opportunities uh, to include many, much more segments, 60 million visitors and 383,000 uh, jobs. I see it as quite uh, uh, modest. Could it be a million or half a million? It, it could be if it's done responsibly. Responsible sustainable tourism is a goal of the city and it's where we're moving our focus of our energies over the next years and decades. Part of what is important is to make a destination inclusive and accessible for tourists. It first needs to be accessible and inclusive to its residents. And you heard Commissioner Calise say before that fully 10% of New York City residents are, are dealing with some form of disability. Uh, and the city has done a really good job over time, and particularly this administration, and being so inclusive and, and, and uh, bringing some of the equality issues to the forefront. Uh, are, are making investments, and those investments that they're making are, are open to all, and that's really what's important because no one's getting left behind in this conversation. And in New York City, if you looked at it 20 years ago, there was a, from a content perspective, it was focused primarily on the Midtown core. And most people came to New York and they, they visited Times Square and they went to the Statue of Liberty and they saw things that were here. What we're seeing and what we're starting to develop now are more opportunities in further destinations creating compression outside the Midtown Core. So in areas like Jamaica and the North Shore of Staten Island and places in the Bronx to give folks the opportunity to have some scale when they go to these places that may take some time to get to if they're on a limited itinerary. So if you have a half a day and you know that you'll be able to do shopping and dining and culture, you'll be more adept to get onto our 24-hour subway system to be able to get out to the Bronx or Staten Island or some further reaching place. Uh, Daniela, as a hotel operator, uh, lots of the international chains have uh, catered for the accessible market uh, for many years. But as uh, I believe uh, uh, one of the, uh, our uh, guests here today mentioned that there is a stigma around the rooms that it is uh, fitted uh, for accessibility. How can a hotel operator uh, go above this and become more uh, receptive? Uh, since, the, since the company, uh, as I will use as an example, Hilton operates in almost every country in the world. There is always a Hilton. Uh, how can this, uh, uh, what you have in the developed market, be transferred into the developing uh, countries and the receptive uh, destinations. 
Yeah, so I think there's a few different components of that. I mean, so much of what we're talking about here is um, partially behavioral change. I think it's partially, um, you know, a, a new social uh, contract in terms of the way that we operate as we grow. Um, and, you know, like I said before, I think responsible and sustainable tourism is key. I think that has to be the future for tourism period going forward. Um, and one of the things that I'm reminded of so, is that, you know, we, we actually recently launched um, the Hilton Africa Growth Initiative, which is 50, a $50 million investment over the next five years towards continued expansion in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, the key here and, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is sustainable growth, right? So how do you, from the beginning, as you grow, think about these issues, thinking about issues of accessibility, thinking about issues of information, thinking about issues around awareness? I think so much of what we're, we're talking about on this issue is, is really raising awareness. And, you know, another example of that can be through innovation and technology. So we're um, constantly innovating and thinking about what's next. And one, you know, really cool example of that that also gets at the heart of what we're talking about through accessibility is something that we called that we call connected room, um, and we're piloting that right now. And you know, we hope to roll it out globally. And that essentially empowers all of us, any of us who are a guest at one of our properties, to go into the room and to tailor it to what you need, to tailor it to the room temperature that you need, to um, you know, upload either everything as simple as your songs, but on through to some of the more technical things you need. It, it essentially gives you the tool as the consumer um, to do with it what you want. And so I do think as we move towards some of these technological solutions, we're going to get not only at accessibility issues, but you're also going to start raising awareness of how these should be built and baked into the design, right? It shouldn't just be your your one room. It should be a part of how you build going forward. So that's definitely something that we're looking about and at, and something I'm very excited about. Okay, with uh, brick and mortar hotel operators, it's easy to put a plan, put a unified designs, or adjust your designs to fit a certain uh, niche uh, and, and certain uh, needs for groups of people. What about the new economy, the host uh, concept like an Airbnb or in the indigenous uh, platform? How can you control these inputs and make uh, the host uh, residences uh, more accessible unless it was designed uh, from the beginning for a person uh, who needs accessibility? Sure. Um, well, I think first of all, the, you know, it, all of this goes back to the exciting opportunity that technology is providing. It's bringing new types of um, opportunities into the travel sector in a way that uh, allows many different people to benefit who traditionally weren't able to benefit directly from that. I think specifically as it relates to accessibility and, and other issues like that, our focus really is on education uh, and clear communication uh, and making sure that um, people who are traveling uh, are able to communicate their needs and understand what those needs are. Um, but I think a, a, another important opportunity in this space is um, the economic opportunity provided to people with disabilities uh, who are hosting. There's a growing community of people around the world um, who are able to host on platforms like Accommable, platforms like Airbnb, um, and allow themselves to now become beneficiaries of this growing uh, tourism sector. Um, that's not only true in this space, but also in uh, rural communities, in places where uh, you know, there have not always been traditional accommodations, uh, but local, um, local people are able to now in, um, receive visitors into their home um, and make uh, additional income as a result of that. So I think as we look at this, you know, we really want to be flexible in uh, thinking about how we can make sure that not only are we um, addressing needs, uh, many different types of needs, but we're also ensuring that the benefits really are felt in many different communities, uh, many of which traditionally haven't been able to feel those benefits. Thank you, Clark. What about you, Tui, and the uh, indigenous uh, module? Yes, uh, in, in regards to resilience, you know, uh, there's already existing studies that talk about how indigenous tourism uh, provides for low economic leakages, you know, much like um, 
Clark was talking about with Airbnb. And uh, it also encourages cross-cultural understandings and the building of that. Uh, so in considering uh, those things, I've also been looking a lot at our Indigenous hosts. And a lot of them around the world, are, 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 it's very quite ad hoc. Uh, you'll find some of them on Instagram, and you'll find some of them on uh, have web pages, and some are on on Facebook. And and what we're able to do now with our native XP is to bring everybody together um, as a community of Indigenous uh, tourism providers, so that we can start to discuss what what is it that we need to um, for our communities, and uh, what will strengthen and and promote. The, the voice of Indigenous tourism. So um, I think it can be demonstrated on multiple levels, not only as being Indigenous hosts and contributing to ending poverty within communities, uh, security of land tenure as well, which is very important to Indigenous peoples, uh, but also uh, that we can consider it in a, in a, in a wider sense of, of building that voice of Indigenous peoples and, and really uh, bringing change around the industry. Thank you, Tui. Uh, always a question comes to the capital and the availability of capital and the use of capital. So my next question is that how can we operate uh, responsible investment policies that can create sustainable communities, uh, accessible, inclusive, equitable, with uh, potential for development uh, both in human capital and in uh, physical uh, material. So uh, I have this uh, question across uh, the board uh, for our panelists. Uh, Daniela, would you like to start on that uh, track? Sure, happy to. <laughs> so I'm, I'm also going to put my public-private partnership hat on. I mean, I, I worked in, in government and diplomacy and with the UN for many, many years. And I think, you know, the beauty of the Sustainable Development Goals is that they've set out a framework and um, a new way for us all to really do business. I think that the issues that we're all trying to get at, whether it's sustainable travel and tourism or inclusive, inclusivity or decent work and economic growth, these are not things that any of us can do on our own individually. They're things that we all have to partner to do together. And I think when you start with that in mind and when you start with what I like to call a value chain approach in mind, um, that's where you're going to start to see some of these changes. So as I look at our strategy and you know where, where we invest on the travel with purpose side, which is our corporate responsibility strategy, we look across three different core areas. So from a value chain approach, we'll say, okay, what can we do from the hotel side? What can we do within our own operations and within our team? Members. And then we look at what can we do with guests. So hotels and guests is sort of one big piece of this value chain. And then we say, okay, what can we do within our communities? What are the, the key most urgent issues? And you know, how can we move the dial on those, whether they're environmental, economic, and social, or, young, or dealing with young people and economic opportunity? And then we look at our supply chain. I think one of the, the biggest areas around investment that we actually haven't talked about here is supply chains. Supply chains is really where you have some um, major opportunity to look at diversity and inclusion and to really expand economic opportunities for people. We have a massive supply chain um, and a number of other companies and organizations and governments are in our supply chain and we're in theirs and vice versa. So I think this becomes another powerful um, way to look and think about investment. And when you start to have those value chain conversations from the front, um, from the front end as you're looking at investments, that's where you start to move the dial on a lot of these key issues. And I think even on the sustainability, the sustainable development goals and on SDG one and all of the others we're talking about, you have to start from the design side with a value chain approach. Uh, Lynn, please. Uh, 
it's probably a bit self-serving, but I think there's a role for the, um, the universities in here too. Very often um, research is a, a key part of understanding both communities, and I particularly think of big companies like Hilton or even Airbnb that operate in so many environments. Um, it can be tempting to try and, and apply a one-size-fits-all, which I'm sure neither of you are actually doing, but understanding the local environment is so important. Um, and universities want to partner with business, and, and our students want to see how what they learn in class really transfers to uh, what the real world is doing. So I think the role of universities shouldn't be underestimated here. Definitely the role of uh, research and uh, universe and academia is uh, always uh, the backbone and the uh, always uh, take the initiative in creating the overture for uh, further uh, enhancement. I'll take on this uh, theme and I'll borrow from our previous uh, panelists the area of, of um, collaboration and the need to be more uh, inclusive. Uh, you mentioned academia, private sector, public-private uh, partnership, uh, indigenous societies. Uh, on co collaboration, do we need new legislations or do we need to uh, work within the existing uh, legal uh, frameworks? And do we have enough protections for the vulnerable uh, segments in the societies, or uh, do we need to do more? Perhaps, uh, Clark, since you work, your company works directly with the uh, providers uh, in this case. Sure. I mean, our, our approach really has been to find local partners that are connected to those communities uh, and bring our information to the table uh, as an equal partner, but learn from them as well. So, for example, um, we've partnered with the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, um, holding trainings for um, rural working women uh, across the country, basically helping them learn how to become an Airbnb host. Um, people know a lot about hospitality. Uh, they don't always know how to use, you know, the app on their phone on how to become a host easily. And so we can, ho um, we, we've held a series of trainings uh, through that partnership and now have actual members of SEWA um, with their listings up on Airbnb uh, earning additional income. Um, we've done similar partnership with uh, Open Africa uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, in South Africa, uh, training um, women again, uh, again, very similar, how to use um, uh, the platform, how to become a host, what are the best practices. Um, and, you know, we've really seen those uh, not only have a great effect, but also really be a wonderful learning for us um, about the ways in which we can work closely with local organizations uh, to make sure that that impact is really, um, you know, felt in, in, in a variety of places. Uh. Brian, uh, we, when we come to legislation, uh, as your organization is a public-private uh, partnership. Do you see the industry in New York City regulated or over-regulated at this point? Because do we, it was just started a few years back that, uh, for example, tour guides had to have a licensing uh, system before anybody can just go and play uh, tour guide regardless of the, the information and its accuracy given. What about the other segments? Transportation, which is a major component of the industry. Uh, culinary uh, establishment and uh, restaurants, etc. cetera. Uh, in going down the chain, how, how important it is to uh, work with the existing legislation or move forward with proposing new uh, uh, laws uh, to be in place. Thank you. Uh, well, as I'm sure you're aware, with any legislation, it's a double-edged sword, right? So it's a, almost like a recipe, just a pinch will do. Uh, in terms of some of the recent legislation that the city's put out, you know, the growth in tourism here over a particularly short period of time, you know, going to, you know, 60 million tourists, you know, the last year from a base of 36 million just 10 years ago, um, that's incredible growth that needs to be managed. And one of the ways that it is managed is through legislation. Uh, regulation of the roads, uh, regulations of um, the certain um, segments like restaurants um, as they pop up uh, fairly frequently. Um, but in, in a balanced approach, in a balanced approach to make sure that we're not constraining the private investment in a way that it's not incentivized to continue investing. Uh, Tui, would you like to? 
Sure, thank you. I just wanted to pick up on a few uh, points as well. So like I said, I've, I've only been in New York for less than 24 hours, but I, I did manage to uh, meet up with some uh, uh, local indigenous peoples that I know and learnt about some potential New York experiences. Uh, there are guides that can uh, take people around the museums. Uh, there is talk about an indigenous restaurant. Um, there could be places where you could go to a market and purchase indigenous food. So um, after uh, tonight and over the weekend, I'll be sitting with them and, and talking more about the potential uh, for them to come on board as well. Uh, so, and, and we need to do that to partner as well. Um, as I said earlier, we ha we've partnered with Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Uh, some of you here at the UN will likely know about them. They work in 40 different countries across Asia, Asia particularly in Indigenous communities, uh, with RIPON in Russia, who represent 270,000 uh, Indigenous Russians across 60% of uh, the territories of Russia. Uh, here uh, this weekend, hoping to confirm our North American partner, and largely, again, because uh, we not only need our Indigenous hosts to understand the technology about how to sign up to be a host, but we also really want them to be providing amazing experiences uh, that they're sustainable as well as uh, that they can be successful business people. And we understand that um, everybody's success uh, will uh, be a huge part of uh, the journey. Thank you. Now we come to uh, 10 minutes before our closing uh, for this session, and we would like to open uh, the floor for uh, your questions, and me and the panelists would love to answer. Director Bass, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, as a beneficiary of tourism, because my travel implies lots of traveling, so there is also the congressional tourism. There are many kinds of tourism. Um, and also as a person with a disability, so I also look at it from another perspective when I travel for pleasure. I, I want to thank all the panelists for their contribution. Um, I would like also allow me to thank my, my team. They have done an amazing job, including Cosmas, who called... Uh, Professor Anderson saying, try to make it not too boring, um, and, and many others, Melissa and Robert and, 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 and others. Uh, so thank you very much for, for this job that you have done so far. Uh, the topic of this afternoon was brought to the, the, the attention of the audience and also the panelists with the idea to encourage multi-stakeholder partnerships to positively impact the prosperity and the well-being of vulnerable communities living in urban areas in order to build the future societies for all we want that are inclusive and that also promote resilience. And we focused with this second panel on one of the many groups that can contribute by working together with city leaders or leaders of urban areas, how the private sector and the public sector together can work and how, for instance, the industry of tourism and all the services and products that it, it provides, not only hotels, restaurants, uh, parks, uh, leisure area, areas where you have spend your leisure time, etc., etc., how all of this actually can contribute to the well-being of communities and the well-being of vulnerable groups because in order to welcome tourists, also the tourism industry um, uh, somehow promotes and provides infrastructures that, are, uh, that make uh, their, uh, the offers uh, of their products accessible to all. So this was the idea. And we heard um, many different good practices in the afternoon here. So I would like to thank you all for this. Therefore, to move towards inclusive and accessible and resilient societies for the future we want for everybody. Uh, we noticed and we understood that tourism and good industry practices of tourism uh, can fulfill the needs of tourists, but also of uh, house communities 
addressing the social problems. So thank you very much for that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, launch here an idea that maybe this could be one of a series of um, events we might wish to organize towards the topic by looking at it from different angles because like Daniela, like me, Daniela, <laughs> me, only one L, <laughs> two L's, I know, <laughs> um, and, and other panelists said, we are just mentioning a few, very few areas of the very complex uh, topic we wanted to start tackling today. And the UN is the platform, it offers, it's the forum where we can gather together and partner Goal 17. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director uh, Bass. And uh, we move with our Q&A, uh, the lady. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kyra Eubanks, and I'm a 22-year-old youth intern here at the New Future Foundation here at the United Nations. And the question I have is, uh, what are examples of training um, that focus on young people? And also, how can we invest, um, how can young people contribute to the investment within the tourism sector? Thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. Uh, perhaps... Daniela, we take the lead on this uh, one. Happy to. So, you know, a couple. There we go. A couple of points on this. So I was actually here at the UN for the UN Youth Assembly, and one of the things that, that I did here was to preview um, the 2017 Global Youth Wellbeing Index. And it's an index that looks holistically across youth well-being, everything from um, health and well-being to safety and security to technology connectedness, economic opportunity, education, the whole holistic uh, aspects of well-being. And one of the the, the top line things that came out of that is that young people are more technologically connected than they've ever been in history. Um, they're also more educated than they've ever been in history, but they are simultaneously more disconnected to public institutions, to um, formal economic opportunities, to industries, things of that nature. And so what I think this highlights is that all of us up here on the panel in some way, shape, or form have a role to play in engaging young people in travel and tourism. So the reality is we know it, there's plenty of jobs out there. The gap is usually young people don't know what those are. Um, so part of what we've done at Hilton is we have sort of a three-point way that we engage young people. We connect them. So we connect them with career pathways so they know what uh, a role or a future future and hospitality, travel and tourism could look like. We prepare them. So we have a partnership with International Youth Foundation and we have a program called Passport to Success. We offer it globally around the world. It provides foundational soft and life skills training for young people so that they're ready to enter um, the workforce. And then we employ young people. We do that through apprenticeships. We do it through internships. We do it through formal employment. We also employ veterans, persons with disabilities. The, the diversity piece for us is, is huge. It's something we're very focused on. So there's a ton of resources out there, but I do think these forums are important because the, the connecting piece and the raising awareness is, is really key. I think there's just not a, a broad understanding for young people of what the opportunities look like in the industry. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Uh, Clark, can you please uh, give us uh, your perspective on this uh, the training and creating jobs for the young people? Sure. Well, I think um, um, one of the things that's, that's frankly really exciting about millennials is, is their interest in travel. Part of the reason travel is growing is because millennials would rather spend their money on experiences uh, than, than things. And in fact, not just experiences, but authentic experiences. Uh, and that is what's so uh, at the heart of this opportunity. It's not just traveling to a place, it's traveling to a place and seeing it how someone who lives there sees it. Um, and really understanding the fabric of the community. And that's, you know, that's what we're so excited about um, and the opportunity that we see through, um, you know, through new technologies and new platforms. Uh, you, know, you can go and not only see a city, 
you can see it as a local does. And you can actually understand the person who lives there uh, and break down some of the barriers um, you know, that all of us uh, hope to break down through these conversations. So I think um, not really an answer to your question, but I think the, you know, the opportunity that millennials provide and, and the trend that they're setting um, is really, it's an optimistic uh, thing to be looking at and I think creates an opportunity for all of us uh, to, to really focus in on how that, ha that travel can happen sustainably and in a positive way. Thank you, Clark. Uh, as Director Bash said, uh, this is just a start of a long path and uh, it opens a lot of uh, areas that we can further explore in details, whether through another uh, sessions or even a dedicated multi-day uh, conference uh, in this regard. Uh, with this note, I wish to thank uh, my panelists and I wish to thank uh, Dessa and Director uh, Daniela Paz and her uh, wonderful uh, team uh, to all the hard work and uh, details they have managed to, uh, to iron and provide uh, the best uh, possible outcome through a, a lengthy day started uh, from this morning. And thank all of you for being with us uh, for the afternoon session. Thank you.